<sighs> Anissa, I like your new haircut. Love it. Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Baker. Yeah. Councilor Bach. Present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Campbell. Here. Councilor Edwards. Here. Councilor Asabi George. Present. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Janey. Present. Councilor Mejia. Present. Councilor O'Malley. <coughs> Councilor Wu. Present. Madam President, um, you have a quarum. Thank you so much. I've been informed by our clerk that a quorum is present. Um, today is our first meeting of the year, and I've invited uh, Reverend Willie Broderick to preside and, and open up with prayer. It is certainly my pleasure to have Reverend Broderick here with us today as he has become or is becoming the senior pastor leading the historic 12th Baptist Church, which is my family's church, my home church. Had a wonderful MLK service this past Sunday, um, celebrating Dr. King's legacy, along with other elected officials. Attorney Mara Healy gave an amazing dynamic keynote. Uh, Reverend Broderick has been a, a, a friend to this body, a friend to this city. He has been a strong advocate and ally on issues that matter. And I'm grateful that he is here to, to open up and start us off uh, in this new year. So without further ado, Reverend Broderick, you now have the floor. Thank you, Council President Janey, and thank you to each and every one of you. Happy New Year, first and foremost. Uh, Happy New Year to each and every person who's viewing this particular meeting. I am very honored to be here, and I'm glad to take over as I started January 1 as senior pastor of the historic 12th Baptist Church, and I am thankful to count you all as partners in the work of justice. I'm honored to open up this first meeting of the year, and without further ado, let us go to God in prayer. Let us bow. Most gracious and wise God, we gather on this day thanking you for life, health, and strength. And we come to you into this new year with a heaviness due to the fact that we are facing a pandemic that has ravaged our nation and our city. And God, we recognize the vulnerabilities of our system and the ways in which it is disproportionately affected our black and brown communities. God, we pray for those who are battling this disease and we ask for comfort for those who are grieving. Yet we still have hope because we believe that this new year brings to us an opportunity for new possibilities. God, we ask that your blessings be upon the women and men of this council who have been chosen to lead this city at this appointed time. And we are thankful that this duly elected body is more representative of the diversity of this great city. God, so much is happening in Boston, and I pray that as we transition into this new era, this new year of leadership, that this council continues to acknowledge their great responsibility to serve each and every constituent in all of our communities equitably. Let this council work to ensure that our schools close opportunity gaps in our education system. Let this council work to advocate for families that are facing housing, job, and food insecurity. Let this council work to support our frontline workers and first responders. Oh God, let this council present a budget that will address the cries for justice and healing. So as this body leads in this important time in our nation, I pray, oh God, that you grant them the wisdom and the courage to do that which is right and good. Because now more than ever, oh God, we need your divine power to shore up the vulnerabilities of our democracy. So as they deliberate the business of this city, I close in the words of the one who we will celebrate on next Monday. 
that great prophet, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said the ultimate measure of a man or woman is not where he or she stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he or she stands at the times of challenge and controversy. Our times of challenge are here, but I pray, God, that you give this council the strength to be courageous. This we pray in all that we count as holy and sacred. In the name of the one who I call Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, let every heart and mind say amen. 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 And thank you so much. At this time, we will pledge allegiance to the flag. Reverend Broderick, I hope you will join us for that. I know how busy you are. Feel free to stay on <clears throat> at the public meeting or excuse yourself at your convenience. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America, America and to the, and Republic, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. Thank you uh, so much. Um, I know folks, just a, a quick announcement, I know folks have seen uh, the state of it a uh, city address that our mayor gave yesterday and are aware of all the things um, that are happening in our city. Um, our mayor has been nominated for a U.S. secretary, and I'm sure his city is very proud. Uh, we're all very proud. And on behalf of the entire city council, want to um, thank him for his service, want to congratulate him um, on that. That certainly does mean there will be some movement here. Um, as he announced yesterday, uh, if he is uh, confirmed by the United States Senate, I will become acting mayor. And so we are planning that transition. And there's also a transition on, on, on this side. And so want all colleagues to know that uh, Vice President O'Malley and I are in a communication and have been begun that uh, transition as well. And I know Councilor O'Malley is going to be phenomenal uh, when he presides over the council meetings. Um, so, Madam Clerk, if you could, uh, we just spoke him into existence. <laughs> if you could amend the attendance Perfect. report to reflect that Councilor O'Malley has joined us. And Thank now you. we'll move on to the first order of business, which uh, is the approval of our minutes, seeing and hearing no discussion. Um, oh. but we didn't have the, the last meeting that from last year, so we will approve that. There's no discussion here. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? I will. Thank you. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, the minutes have, the approval of the minutes is passed unanimously. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to communications from His Honor the Mayor, beginning with docket 0112. Madam Clerk, could you please read that? Thank you. Docket 0112 message disapproving an ordinance amending chapter 12-9 of the city of boston code code ordinances regarding human rights docket number 0945 passed by the city council december 16 2020 along with this veto i am recommending that the council pass in a new draft filed in the office of the city clerk on december 31st 2020 Thank you so much. Docket 0112 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. We'll move on to Docket 0113. 
Thank you. Docket 0113, message disapproving an ordinance restricting the use of chemical crowd control agents known as CCCA and kinetic impact projectiles known as KIP, passed by the City Council December 16, 2020, filed in the office of the City Clerk on December 31st, 2020. Thank you so much, Docket 0113. We'll also be referred to the Committee on Government Operations and assigned for further action. We will move on to Docket 0114. Thank you. Docket 0114, message and order approving a supplemental appropriation of $1,857,220 for the Boston Public Schools for the FY21 to cover the cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston School Committee and the Boston excuse me, Association of School Administrators and Supervisors, known as BASIS, filed in the office of the city clerk. Would you like me to read the next one also? Uh, yes, Madam Clerk, if you Thank could you. Read, that would be great. Docket 0115, message in order to reduce the appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $1,857,220 to provide funding in the Boston Public Schools for the FY21 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Association of School Administrators and Su Supervisors, known as BASIS. Thank you so much. Docket 0114 and Docket 0115 will be both assigned to the Committee of Ways and Means, and we'll move on to Docket 116. Docket 0116, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and extend an amount of $1,801,406 in the form of a grant. FY21 Senator Charles E. Shannon Jr. Community Safety Initiative Grant awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Boston Police Department. The grant will fund regional and multidisciplinary approaches to combat to combat gang violence through coordinated prevention and intervention, law enforcement, prosecution, and reintegration programs. Thank you so much. Docket 0116 will be assigned to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Um, Docket. Well, yep, go ahead. Docket number 0117, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $125,000 in the form of a grant for the 2019 Bar Fellowship awarded by the Bar Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office. The grant will fund leadership and organizational development in the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Docket 0117 will be assigned to the Committee of City and Neighborhood Services. You could go on to Docket 0118, please. Thank you. Docket 0118, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $123,306 in the form of a grant for the FY20 reducing injury and death of missing individuals with dementia and developmental disabilities, awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund the purchase safety net tracking subscriptions for 225 families of individuals that tend to wander due to dementia or developmental disabilities. Thank you so much. Docket 0118 will be assigned to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket 0119, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of 114737 dollars in the form of a grant for the 2019 Port Security Grant awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Fire Department. The grant will support increased port-wide risk management and protection, critical service, transportation, infrastructure. Thank you so much. Docket 0119 will also be assigned to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We'll move on to docket, the next docket, which is 0120. Thank you. Docket 0120, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of 
$335 in the form of a grant for the federal FY 2020 Emergency Management Performance Grant awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency passed to the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. The grant will fund the increased ability to effectively provide prompt and accurate public information and alerts. It will also enhance capacity across the Commonwealth to recover from acts of terrorism, as well as natural technological and interintentional hazards. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Docket 0120 will be uh, referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We'll go on to docket 0121. Thank you. Docket 0121, message and order, authorize the City of Boston to accept an amount of a grant in the amount of $40,000 in the form of a grant for the FFY 2020 Municipal Road Safety awarded by the United States Department of Transportation, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and security to be administered by the Boston Police Department. The grant will fund high visibility traffic enforcement of motor vehicle laws, including, but not limited to, speeding and aggressive driving, distracted driving, impaired driving, and occupant protection. Thank you so much, Docket 0121 will be assigned to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. The next docket is 0122. Thank you. Docket 0122, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $29,526 in the form of a grant for the Boston Children's Collaborative for Community Health awarded by the Boston Children's Hospital to be administered by the Office of Food Access. The grant will fund the Boston Eats program to improve the health and well being of children and families disproportionately impacted by inequity in health and the social detriments of health. Thank you so much. At this time, the chair recognizes Councilor Braden, uh, who is chair of the Committee on Strong Women, Families and Communities. Councilor Braden, you have- Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, at this time, I seek to suspend the rules and pass docket 0122 to support the Boston Eats program, uh, which is working to address the food gap and uh, COVID-19 uh, food insecurity by providing no-cost meals to uh, youth ages 18 and under. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. Seek suspension of the rules. And passage of docket 0122. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Oops, sorry. Docket 0122. Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Ar Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker? Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Bach? Yes. Councillor Bach, yes. Councillor Braden? Yes. Councillor Braden, yes. Councillor Campbell? Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards? Yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Asabi George? Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn? Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Janey? Yes. Councillor Janey, yes. Councillor Mejia? Yes. Councillor Mejia, yes. Councillor O'Malley? Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. And Councillor Wu? Yes. Councillor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0122 has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. Docket 0122 has passed. We will now move on to docket 0123. Docket 0123, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $10,000 in the form of a grant for the VP, VP Fund Program awarded by the Boston Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office. The grant will fund resilience and racial equity for truth and healing. Narratives and conversations about the integration of Boston's public school system. Thank you so much. At this time, the chair recognizes Council Mejia, who is the chair of the Committee on Civil Rights. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, 
Thank you, Madam President. As someone who grew up in the era of integration um, in the Boston public school system, I have experienced firsthand the need for truth and healing. Um, restorative actions cannot take place without conversation. And this grant for 10,000 um, seeks to do just that. This grant was awarded by the Boston Foundation and would be administered by the mayor's office. And I hope that we all have the opportunity to take part in this program. By calling people in and encouraging them to share their stories, we move one step closer to racial equity and resilience in our city. I move that we suspend the rules and accept this grant. Thank you so much. Councilor Mayor Bahia seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0123. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you. On docket 0123, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Oh. Councilor yes. <laughs> Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0123 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you so much. We'll move on to docket 0124. Mm -hmm. Docket 0124, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $10,000 in the form of a grant. The C Sim Simone Foundation donation awarded by Frank R. and Elizabeth C S Simone Foundation, Inc. to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund initiatives to support training activities and support relating to work of the Boston Police Department Homicide Unit. Thank you. Docket 0124 will be referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Madam Clerk, could you please read Docket 0125? Thank you. Docket 0125, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Michael P. Monahan as a member of the Boston Redevelopment Authority for term expiring August 23rd, 2023. Thank you so much. Docket 0125 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Now we will move on to reports of public officers and others. Um, and if we could read, if you could read Docket 0126 through 0141, we'll read all of those together, please. Great. Thank you. Docket 0126, notice this is Stephen Mayor of the reappointment of Michael O'Neill as a member of the Boston School Committee for a term expiring January 4th, 2025. Docket number 0127 notices you see from the mayor of the appointment of Barbara Parker as a director of labor relations and the Boston Public Schools Labor, labor Office, effective November 17th, 2020. Docket number 0128, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Andrea Leards as a chairperson of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0129, message and order for the confirmation of the reappointment of David Essien as a member of the Boston Civic Design for term expiring on October 31st, 2023. Madam, Madam President, um, if I may just raise this, um, the first two will be placed on file, but the, these are confirmations. So they, and, and I don't know why we, I didn't pick this up earlier either, is um, they would be referred um, to planning, yep. development, and transportation. I'm so, so sorry. That's okay. We'll take, so we, we will just have, now that we have 126 and 127. Correct. Into the record. Dockets 0126, docket 0127 will be placed on file. Right. We will, though, read Madam Clerk 128 through Again. 121 together. Right. 
Thank you. And if you could just start again with 128. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, you so much. Um, docket 0128, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Andrea Lears as the chairperson of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring on October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0129, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of David Hassan as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring on October 31st, 2023. Docket number 0130, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of David Manfredi as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring on October 31st, 2023. And docket number 0131, to do an order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Janine Crosby as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring October 31st, 2023. Planning and development. Yep. Um, and um, Madam Clerk, mm -hmm. did you stop at docket 0131? I, I did because that is not, that is just an appointment. So we could read, if we, could, uh, we could assign those and then read this one and then go back to um, two more confirmations. So for these, these are four dockets, 0128 through 0131. They will be placed on file. Um, if you could read docket, just read the next one by itself, docket 0132. Madam President? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I think those four were meant to go to planning and development. Oh, yes. They okay. are. Thank you. I misspoke. <laughs> docket 0128 through 0131 will go to the Committee of Planning, Development, and Transportation. Docket 0132, if you could read that. Thank you, Madam President. Docket, docket 0132, notice is received from the mayor of the reappointment of Eric Howler as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring on October 31st, 2022. Okay, and so docket 0132 will be placed on file. Um, if you could- As I read that- Madam President, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know how this happened, but as I read it, although it doesn't say confirmation, um, unless if he's being reappointed and is to the Boston Civic, I think it has to be a confirmation, even though that is not the way it was submitted. So I just wouldn't want someone not to be formally confirmed by- Absolutely. So we will place, this is docket 0132. We will place this docket in the Committee of Planning, mm -hmm. Development, and Transportation. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so sorry about this. All right, and now docket number 0133, message and order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Nick Young Kim as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring on October 31st, 2023. And then docket number 0134, um, message and order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Kirk Sykes as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring on October 31st, 2022. And I believe that although this does not say, I, I think they were filed incorrectly. I could be wrong, but. We'll put them in the committee. These, these two will go into the Committee of Planning, right. Development and Transportation. So this is docket yes. 0133 and docket 0134. Right, thank you. Now, if you could read docket, the next docket by itself. All right. Docket. Madam President, may I, sorry, point yeah. of parliamentary inquiry? Yes. I think, I think as the clerk alluded to, I think somebody mistitled these, but that 0135, when you look at it in the packet, it's identical in form to all the others. So I think it's actually going to planning development and transportation. Right. Together, yes, and I don't have the full package, just the right. agenda. Madam Clerk, if you could please read the docket so we make sure we have it before the body. Um, and I'll put yeah, it- Madam, Madam President, could, could we, um, could we recess for a moment? I am being contacted by um, 
a staff member who is suggesting that there has been a typo, but I thought the civic, uh, the Boston Civic Design Commission has always been confirmation. Yes, we will pause for a brief recess. Just, so we then, will straighten out what the issue is with these dockets and make right. sure that they will be uh, in the appropriate committees. Okay, Madam thank you. Madam President. Yes. Yeah. Madam President, just interject. So I, we also have a residency requirement and I noticed so we have a Brookline, a Cane. Just want to say happy new year. Thank you. Happy new year. You too. Can you put your mic on mute just in case you're going to talk. Madam, oh, <laughs> craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, Um, and Council of Flaherty, um, boards and commissions do not require residency. Oh, I understand that's just a little peculiar that uh, we're going to have people from Cambridge, Brookline, and Somerville uh, telling us what our building should look like. I'm not quite sure if someone was paying attention over there. Right. Um, I do know that they, um, uh, because our office wears them in, so I am aware that they're, I will just wait until we hear back from the president. One moment. If they're statutory, Madam Clerk, that's one thing, but uh, we have a lot of great people in our city that would love to serve in that capacity and no reason why we need to look outside uh, uh, city boundaries to find capable, competent people that want to commit.
I beg your indulgence. Um, as originally proposed by President <laughs> Janey, all of these items from 0126 through 0141 are appointments or matters that are always placed on file. Um, somehow the word confirmation was placed in several of these. And when we research boards and commissions, they do not require confirmation. They're simply appointments. And to your question, Council, Council of Clarity, and there is no residency required um, on boards and commissions. To so, so you Thank have you, that. Part. You're welcome. Thank you. uh, so, Madam President, if you would indulge me to read 0128 through 0141, and then we can place all those matters on file. 128 through 141. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. And again, I apologize. And yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. 0128, message in order for the appointment of Andrea Lears as a chairperson of the Boston Civic Design Commission uh, for a term expiring October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0129, message in order for the, the appointment of David Hassin as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring October 31st, 2023. Docket number 0130, message in order for the the appointment, the reappointment of David Manfredi as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring on October 31st, 2023. Docket number 0131, message and order for the reappointment of Deneen Crosby as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring on October 31st, 2023. Docket number 0132, notice from the mayor. Uh, received from the mayor of the reappointment of Eric Howler as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring in October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0133, message and order for the reappointment of Mick Young Kim as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring October 31st, 2023. Docket number 0134, message and order for the reappointment of Kirk Sykes as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring on October October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0135, notice is received from the mayor of the reappointment of William Ron as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0136, message and order for the appointment of Jonathan Evans as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0136, message in order for the appointment of Jonathan Evans as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for term expiring on October 31st, 2022. Docket number 0137, notice was message in order for the appointment of Catherine uh, Quateridis as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring November 31st, 2022. Docket number 0138, message and order for the appointment of Mimi Garza Love as a member of the Boston Civic Design Commission for a term expiring October 31st, 2021. Docket number 0139, notice was received from the mayor of the reappointment of Alexander McCloy as a member of the Board of Examiners for a term expiring July 1st, 2023. Docket number 0140, notices received from the mayor of the reappointment of Nick Martin as chief communications officer, effective December 4th, 2020. Notices received from the mayor of, the, of his absence of the city from 9 o'clock a.m. until 5 p.m. on Friday, January 8th, 2021. And thank you for your indulgence and patience, Madam President. Thank you so much. And just to clarify, those were dockets uh, 0128 through 0141, yes? Correct. All of those dockets will be placed on file. We will now move on to motions, orders, and resolutions, beginning with docket 0142. Thank you. Docket 0142, Councilors Campbell and Arroyo offer the following order for hearing regarding COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you so much. And as I uh, prepare to call colleagues to speak, just want to remind folks that this agenda is very full. There are several refiles. I'm asking everyone to keep 
their comments extremely brief, especially for the refiles. I understand there may be some new items that require more discussion. If we could really try to self-monitor, that will help the move the meeting move more smoothly and hopefully we will get out of here before the sun sets. So with that being said, the chair now recognizes Councillor uh, Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and because this was a late file at the end of the year, I asked for a little indulgence on this particular one given the topic, but I hear you on the other ones in terms of refiles and be a little bit more brief. Um, uh, so thank you, Madam President, uh, and congratulations, of course, looking forward to continuing to work in partnership with you. I also want to thank uh, Councilor Royal for the partnership on this very important uh, hearing. This is a refiled docket from the end of our last term, and we refiled it because we weren't able, of course, to hold a hearing last year before the end of the last session. Now more than ever, we need to prioritize the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines as they are a critical component of our recovery efforts from the pandemic. We know that our communities, especially communities of color and immigrant communities, including those who are undocumented, are questioning whether or not they should get the vaccine. They're asking certain questions that I've asked myself. What is the racial breakdown of those who participated in the clinical trial? How rigorous was the process? What do we know about the latest mutation of the virus and will the vaccine protect us against it? What are the side effects? There are also concerns about vaccine distribution so far, which we understand have been messy and a logistical challenge for our healthcare providers. While the exact timeline for dis disbursement may continue to shift, it is critical that the city has a plan to distribute the vaccine equitably and efficiently, and of course, that it be free. That means developing strategies, not only with our healthcare providers, but also, of course, with communities of color, organizations on the ground, those who have trusted relationships in our most hard to reach communities. And of course, we want to make sure that those who are disproportionately impacted and vulnerable to the virus have priority as well. And that those who are skeptical of the vaccine and who are less likely to get it, not only proactively get information, but have contact people to be able to follow up with, to be able to get their questions answered on an ongoing basis. We know these are the same communities, of course, that are still struggling with access to COVID-19 testing. And we, of course, have to continue our work there. I look forward to working with each and every one of you on this critical issue. Um, of course, in partnership, having a hearing that includes so many folks with respect to this pressing issue. Thank you again, Madam President, uh, for the indulgence. Thank you so much. And at this time, the chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. I'll be brief. Uh, there's likely no more important uh, issue before this city and before this body than the way in which we engage with the pandemic we are currently in. Uh, the vaccine uh, process is incredibly important to our residents and making sure that we're doing everything we can as a city to create a stable pipeline and a, and a stable uh, operation for the distribution of that vaccine is incredibly important. But education of what these vaccines do is also incredibly important uh, and the process that went into creating them. And so I'm hoping uh, to hold this hearing uh, relatively soon uh, so that we can start that process, um, considering the, the state of emergency that we are in and, and considering the urgency of the issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else looking to, to speak on this matter? Anyone looking to add their name? Show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Wu, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Bob, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn. Please also add the chair. Thank you so much. Um, Docket 0142 will be assigned to the Committee of Public Health. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could please read Docket 0143. Thank you. Docket 0143, Councils Campbell and Arroyo offer the following order for hearing regarding the Boston Police Department's gang da database. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. I think my computer froze for a minute. Can you hear me, Madam President? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
thank you. Um, this too is a refile, and I and I thank uh, Council Royal for the partnership on this as well, and also dozens of uh, advocacy organizations who have been mobilizing residents and all of us to think about how we reimagine our policing in communities. And the council, of course, worked really hard on many of these issues. Um, this particular one is critically important. This has been an ongoing conversation for years, um, and advocates have been pushing, uh, particularly the BRIC and others in the police department, to have a more thoughtful conversation on the gang database. Of the 5,000 individuals that are listed in that gap database, over 90% of them are Black and Latinx and labeled gang involved or affiliated by a point system that some deem to be arbitrary. So this is an opportunity to have a hearing for folks to, one, learn about the gang database, the point system, how you get on it, how you get removed from it or how you can remove yourself from it, the challenge there, and then, of course, to talk about the disparities that are built within that system. So looking forward to this hearing and, of course, all of my colleagues, I hope that you will join, join this conversation. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Royo. Councilor Royo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'll be brief again. Uh, the gang database uh, for me has significant concerns. I'm significantly concerned about how the gang database is conducted, uh, how you get on the gang database, uh, the real issues with disparity and inequity in getting off of that database, uh, as well as how and in what ways it's used as a tool. And so I look forward to a hearing uh, with BPD to hear from them directly, and, and I believe with Rick, uh, about how they conduct themselves and how they conduct uh, the gang database and how they see it, you, how they see its usefulness, but also uh, in what ways we can we can work on uh, eliminating or dealing with or addressing those concerns regarding racial inequity and disparity. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't see any blue Zoom hands for anyone wanting to speak. So a show of physical hands, please, for those who want to add their names. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Asabi George, Councillor Brayden, Councillor Wu, Councillor Bach, Councillor Campbell, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Mejia, and Councillor Flynn, Councillor Flaherty, please also add the chair. Did I miss anyone? Wonderful. Um, Madam President, I apologize. Did you, did you hear? I didn't hear my name. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you for it. Um, please also add Councillor Edwards. That's why I double checked. When you guys turn your cameras on and off, the the, the boxes move around, so I'm sorry if I missed you. Um, docket 0143 will be referred to the Committee on uh, Criminal Justice and Public Safety. We'll move on to docket 0144. Please. Madam Clerk, you're on mute. Thank you. Docket 0144, Councilors Mejia and Arroyo offer the following order for hearing, discussing the accessibility of small businesses outreach during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. I'm going to be brief, here we go. Um, so thank you, Madam President. I would like to suspend the rules and add Councilor Ru as an original co-sponsor. Thank um, you. Being and hearing no objections, Councilor Wu has been added as an original uh, co-sponsor. Yeah. This docket is refiled, and as the chair of the Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development, I look forward to continuing to explore this issue into the new year to learn what we can do to truly make our city accessible to every business in Boston. I look forward to working with Councilor Arroyo and Councilor Wu on this issue. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Royal. That that was you get the prize, uh, Councilor Mejia. Woo! Oh, <laughs> I think that was your shortest one yet. <laughs> I, I take feedback really well. You're going to see <laughs> lots of improvement here. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Yeah, everything Councilor Mejia said. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Is this a contest. <laughs> <laughs> the chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Yes, ditto to my two amazing colleagues. Happy to be re-upping um, this, especially in this moment of the pandemic when we need to be focusing on our businesses. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands, please, of those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Bach, and the chair. 
Um, docket 0144 will be assigned to the Committee of Small Business and Workforce. Madam, Madam President? Yes. Madam President, I'm here. I didn't hear my name. Oh, you're frozen. Your hand's not up because your screen's frozen. Yes, so please also add Councilor Sarvi George, and I see Councilor Flaherty has taken his video off and he would like to be added as well. Uh, Councilor Flynn, Thank your you. screen is frozen, so I'm not sure if you're trying to get in. There you go, and please add Councilor yes. What about Councilor O'Malley and Councilor yes. Baker? There's, I don't know. Yep. Councilor just O'Malley, go. Councilor Baker, I think we have Okay, one. great. Thank you so much. Um, Docket zero. Ma Madam President, could you ask? Yes, we added you, Councilor. I apologize. Yes. Yeah, you were frozen, but Th thank you. <laughs> we added you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Docket 0144 will be assigned to the Committee um, of Small Business and Workforce Development. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could read the next two dockets together. This is Docket 0145 and Docket 0146. Sure. I would add, uh, ask the sponsor to speak to both, but we will uh, do them individually so if people want to pick one over the other, okay? Thank you so much. Sure. Docket 0145, Councilor Mejia offered the following order for hearing addressing sexual assault in Boston Public Schools. And docket number 0146, Councilor Mejia offered the following order for hearing addressing the relationship between school lunches and the achievement gap. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Docket 0145 is a refile regarding an issue that was raised during last year's hearing on the role of school police and was inspired by some of the testimonies we heard during um, the, the public hearing from students directly. We hope to hold this hearing sometime in 2021 to learn more about what we can do on the city council. Um, and docket 0146 is also a refile and was written entirely by Sam, one of our amazing high school students who worked with us over the summer. Um, and we look forward to holding a conversation about this topic sometime in the upcoming year. Thank you so much. Not seeing additional speakers. We will take docket 0145 first for a show of physical hands. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Wu. Councillor Edwards, Councillor Bach, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor O'Malley. Anyone else looking to Councillor Flynn? Please also add the chair. Um, Docket 0145 will be assigned to the committee, referred to the Committee on Education. And now a show of physical hands for those who want to add their name to Docket 0146. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Wu, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Edwards, anyone else looking to add your name in case your screen is frozen? Did I get everyone? Yes, please also add the chair and this docket, docket 0146 will also be referred to the uh, Committee of Education. The next docket is 0147, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Docket 0147, Councilor Mejia offered the following order for hearing, addressing civil rights and the creation of sanctuary safe spaces in Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. This docket is a refile from our office's first uh, hearing order. Um, we held a hearing on it um, in December and have been working with an amazing team of advocates ever since. And we plan to file something in addition to this in the near future. But in the meantime, we will um, be refiling this docket. Thank you so much. Not seeing any blue Zoom hands for speakers, a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Flynn, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Bach, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Wu, Councillor Arroyo, and please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0147 will be referred to the Committee of Civil Rights. And uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please read the next two dockets together, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Docket 0146, 
48. Council of Mejia offer the following order for hearing on expanding access for minority businesses, business enterprises into high volume commercial centers. And docket number 0149, Council of Mejia offer the following order for hearing on racism in retail stores in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council of Mejia. Council of Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Docket 0148 is a refile and one that was brought to us um, from advocates who have been very passionate around this issue. Uh, we are looking forward to having a conversation as it relates specifically to the small businesses that are, are in um, high commercial areas but have very little presence of black and brown businesses, and particularly Faneuil Hall. We look forward to having some conversation around how to make space for minority businesses, um, enterprises in some of Boston's highest um, traffic areas. Um, thank you so much. We will, again, treat these individually for people to sign on. Uh, beginning with docket 0148, a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Bach, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Wu, Councillor Campbell, and Councillor Flaherty. Please also add the chair. Uh, with docket 0149, a uh, show of physical hands again. Oh, I didn't even talk about that one. Should I oh. talk about that too first? Yes, please. Madam Clerk has already read them both then. I thought you addressed both of them when I... Oh, no, sorry. We're just trying to trip everybody up today. Just to <laughs> your okay, sorry, that was my mistake. I will own it. So docket 049 is also a refile and was inspired by a Boston Globe article that was uh, released last summer. Uh, we need to not just talk about how to make spaces safe for black and brown entrepreneurs, but we also have to talk about how we can make retail spaces more friendly towards people of color. Everybody deserves to shop with dignity, and we hope to explore that in the hearing sometime soon this year. Thank you so much. Now, uh, for those who would like to add their name to this docket, a show of physical hands, Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Bach, Councillor Wu, Councillor Royal, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Campbell, please also add the chair. Did I miss anyone? Okay, I think I, uh, Councillor Sabi George, please add a Councillor Sabi George. Um, there we go. Both dockets, docket 0148 and 0149 will be. Madam President, you missed me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have Councilor Flaherty? Thank you. No, oh, but I we do now. <laughs> okay. Everyone who wants to be on, sign on, is signed on. Wonderful. Dockets 0148 and 0149 are, are referred to the Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, the Vice Chair of this body to um, take over. Uh, this is for the next docket. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Madam Clerk, would you place before the body docket 0150? Thank you. Docket 0150, Councillors Mejia and Janey offer the following order for hearing identifying restorative justice practices and the role of police in our schools. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. The chair now recognizes the at-large counsel from Dorchester. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I would like to suspend the rules and add Councilor Campbell as an original sponsor to this docket. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councilor Campbell is hereby added as the third co-sponsor. Please proceed. Thank you. The docket is a refile. Um, we held a hearing on the subject last July, but there's still a lot of action that we need to take on this issue. Um, we look forward to working with parents, teachers, students, administrators, and officers, and everybody to find ways to embrace restorative justice in our schools. We look forward to working with counselors, Janie and Campbell on this issue. Thank you very much, Councilor Mejia, for once again demonstrating that brevity is the art of wit. Well said. Uh, Council President Janney, you now have the floor. 
Thank you so much, and I will try to uh, follow suit. I am super proud to join my sisters in service, Councilor Mejia and Councilor Campbell, on this docket. Very important issue. Uh, takes me back to my days at Mass Advocates for Children and the work that we did there around school discipline uh, and, and making sure that we are not using harsh discipline policies and keeping students out of the classroom. We know that what is best is when students are in the classroom learning. Um, all of the data supports this, and I'm looking forward to having a productive hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. The chair now recognizes the uh, district counselor from Mattapan, Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, uh, Council O'Malley, and thank you, of course, my sisters in service for the continued partnership on this incredible, incredibly important issue. Um, and everything they said, I'll just flag, you know, that's how um, Madam President and I met early on, was doing this work around uh, school discipline policy. So appreciate the continued partnership. Thank you both. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Would anyone else like, wish to speak on docket 0150? Seeing and hearing none, would any councillors wish to add their name uh, as a co-sponsor to docket 0150? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Asibi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Bach, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Wu. Please add the chair's name. Seeing and hearing no uh, further uh, additions. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please refer docket 0150 to the Committee on Education? And Madam President, uh, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, we will now move on to uh, docket 0151. Docket 0151, Councilor Mejia offered the following order for hearing discussing youth involvement in regards to police reform. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes uh, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the Thank you, Madam President. This docket is a refile and was an, uh, another hearing order that was written by one of our summer youth policy team members. Last Monday, our office held a town hall on education and the students who sat in repeatedly said that they felt like their voices were not um, being heard and that the louder they shout, the less they are heard. Um, between COVID reopenings, national politics, civil rights, and the upcoming election in the, in the um, elections in November, we need to be really um, mindful and intentional about centering youth voice in these conversations. We hope to hold this hearing to do just that. Not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands for those who want to add their name, please. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Malley, Councillor Bach, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flynn, did I miss anyone? Council of Flaherty, anyone else? Please also add the chair. Um, docket 0151 will be referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We'll move on to Docket 0152. Docket 0152, Councilors Mejia and Wu offer the following order for hearing discussing the viability of late night MBTA services in Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Madam President. This docket is a refile, um, one which we held a hearing on late last year. We're looking to continue this conversation into the new year, especially given the recent news around the proposed MBTA cuts. We look forward to working alongside Councilor Wu um, and all the amazing advocates who have been pushing for a better public transportation in our city. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Wu. Council Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Councilor Mejia, for your partnership. Oh, well, hey, I think uh, Council Wu is now the new winner um, of brevity. Um, uh, this this uh, docket, this is 0152, and it will be referred to the committee of Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please read docket 0153. No one's signed. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, did people want to add their name? Did we, did, please, show of physical hands for folks who want to add their name to this docket. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're in two. Is this the night owl? Is this the night owl service, Madam President? Yes. This sure is we the night are. service for the tea. 
Madam yeah, Council led the effort on that years ago. It'll be great. Please have my name. Wonderful. So, Madam Clerk, just if you guys could raise your hands again. Um, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Royo, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Edwards, Arroyo. Did I miss anyone? I don't know if you're everyone good. Wonderful. This docket, as I mentioned, is referred to the Committee of Planning, Development, and Transportation. We'll move on to docket 0153. Are you signing on, Madam President? Yes, please. Please ask at the chair, please. Docket number 0153, Councilors Mejia and Edwards offered the following order for hearing on public hearing for a hearing on public hearings as they relate to government accountability and accessibility. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. This docket is a refile. We held a hearing on this topic last fall and there's still a lot of work to be done in order to make the public um, hearing process more accessible and transparent. We look forward to working with Councillor Edwards on this issue. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. You're, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Excited to work with Council Mejia, making sure our conversations are as effective as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, docket 015, oh, uh, seeing, <laughs> does anyone want, want to speak? No blue hands. Show a physical hands for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Bach, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Royal, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Wu, Councilor Braden, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Royal, I think I said you twice. Did I get everyone? Councilor Campbell, did I get everyone? Councilor Flaherty, please also add the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, docket 0153 is referred to um, the committee. Rules and administration. Yes, thank you. Um, we will now move on to docket 0154, Madam Clerk. Docket 0154, Councilor Mejia offered the following order for hearing on small businesses' preparedness to reopen during COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. I just want to state for the record that I kept it short and I expect all of my colleagues to model my behavior. If you all go on and on and on with your stuff, I'm going to come back on the mic, okay? No, not. Okay, so thank you, Madam President. <laughs> this is a refile from last year and is a conversation that we definitely need to have, not just during COVID-19 pandemic, but after it is well over, if it ever is over. We need to work to make sure that small businesses who have managed to survive um, in this pandemic are able to reopen in their full capacity in a safe and cautious manner. Wonderful. Not seeing any other speakers a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name to this docket. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Royo, Councilor Malley, Councilor Bach, Councilor Wu, Councilor Campbell. Did I get everyone? Just yourself, madam. Oh, yes, please add the chair. I'd like to go through my colleagues. I'm first. sorry. I got everyone. Yeah. That's okay. Please also add uh, the chair. And this is docket 0154, and it will be referred to the Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development. Madam Clerk, if we could go to the next docket, which is docket 0155. Docket 0155, Councilor Arroyo offered the following petition for a special law regarding an act relative to the office of mayor in the city of Boston. Uh, thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to substitute an updated version of the language of this position. Um, do we need a second here? Seeing and hearing no objections for the substituted language. I want folks to know that that language uh, will be coming from central staff from in your inbox. Okay, so seeing, uh, is there a second on the substitution? 
I was seeing in here. We don't, have, we, don't, we don't have a copy of the substitution, Madam President. It's coming, it's coming in your inbox. I have. The, the should inbox, we to, so we're should just- we wait? Should yes, we wait to get it before we make a decision on whether to accept or reject? No, the, the question is, do we want to put it before the body? Right, the amended language. Right. I haven't seen it. Folks have their inbox? You guys good? I second it. Thank you. So the substitution is now before the body. While folks are looking at their inbox for that language, I um, am going to call upon uh, Council Royal. Thank you, Madam President. Having multiple elections for the office of mayor in the same year in the midst of a pandemic is a serious threat to the health of our residents and communities, will contribute to the disenfranchisement of people of color, disabled and low income communities, it would be a wasteful and costly expenditure for the city at a time when our revenues are down and so many critical services are in need of increased funding. I wanna make clear that everything this petition calls for would happen automatically if Mayor Walsh resigns after March 5th. This has been an extraordinary year. Boston is under a state of emergency and we are in the middle of a deadly pandemic that has claimed the lives of over 1,000 Boston residents today. We are continuing to see COVID positivity rates increase, and we are experiencing alarming numbers of hospitalization. There are also concerns of the spread of a new, more contagious strain of COVID-19 that may become the dominant strain in the United States this year. We know that large-scale vaccinations will take the greater part of this year, if not longer, to reach all of our residents. This is the largest crisis facing the city in our lifetimes, and it would be irresponsible for us to allow for the possibility of four elections for the same office in a five-month span, the very real possibility of three mayoral transitions in this year, and the possibility of four different mayors at the helm in 11 months, solely because the mayor may need to resign a day before March 5th. Under these conditions, when we can act to prevent it, we should. Beyond the added instability for the city at a time when it can least afford it, in-person voting in four elections would require residents to leave their homes to participate in our electoral process, furthering the risk and spread of danger, uh, risk of spread and danger to the health of residents, city workers, and our communities. Furthermore, the pandemic has highlighted and worsened existing inequities in the city of Boston, and Boston, Black, and Latinx Bostonians have borne the disproportionate impact of this virus, with Black residents accounting for 34% of COVID-19 deaths and Latinx residents accounting for 31% of COVID-19 cases. We know that some communities have traditionally faced higher barriers to participating in our elections than others. Low-income, immigrant, disabled, and communities of colors continue to face systemic obstacles when trying to participate in our political system. The ongoing public health emergency and four elections for the same office in the same year only increases those barriers and serves to limit their participation and would disenfranchise these communities. Finally, COVID-19 has had significant impact on the fiscal status of the city of Boston. With revenue shortfalls predicted for the next fiscal year and possibly several after, in addition to expected revenue shortfalls, the demand for essential city services such as public health, food access, public housing, and more will remain high and require significant investment moving forward. Spending precious funds for multiple elections for the same office in the same year is not fiscally responsible. There is a precedent for this action. Lawrence Mass, facing these same, uh, same realities, passed a home rule petition this year, which did precisely what this home rule petition seeks to do. It was passed by the House, Senate, and signed by the governor last week. And in 2007, this body successfully moved to cancel a regularly scheduled preliminary for the Office of Boston City Council at large under circumstances significantly less urgent than we find ourselves in now. And I would note that the language that's before you uh, took part, uh, was part of a meeting that was had on Monday with the Secretary of State's legal team and the City of Boston's legal team and the City of Boston's election department, uh, in which we went over uh, essentially what the language would have to look like uh, to pass muster. And this is what came back. Uh, and so I would also just like to note uh, that several groups have reached out uh, to support this uh, and have put their, their organizations behind this as well. Uh, 
That includes the Secretary of the Commonwealth, William Galvin, uh, the NAACP Boston, Mi Gente Boston, Right to the City Vote, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, Amplify Latinx, the Asian American Resource Workshop, Progressive West Roxbury Rosendale, the Chinese Progressive Association, and the New England United for Justice. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council O'Malley. Council O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, a recent profile of me noted, among other things, the things I'm known for is my cheerful adherence to the rules. So I hope my interpretation of the rules here uh, are, are received with the cheerfulness uh, um, intended. Um, I want to begin by saying this very well may be a moot point. I think that the mayor has said publicly and privately he's not sure. None of us seem to know what exactly the timeline will be for cabinet nominations. I anticipate, I think most of us do, that he should and will be confirmed. Um, it very well be, may be on March 5th or after March 5th, in which case this would be an irrelevant act. Or it may be before March 5th. In fact, it may be March 4th, um, in which case this is triggered. Now, the March 5th uh, line of demarcation, as it were, as it relates to whether or not there would be a special election, is there for a very, very good reason. Um, two main reasons, in fact. One is, of course, whomever is selected, the acting mayor, the council president, you, Madam President, um, will have enormous power invested in, in her um, once she becomes acting mayor. Um, so by having a special election, that this, the, or this, the decision of whether or not to have a special election this far out is meant uh, in the spirit of fairness for an open race. But then the other side of that is that there are certain powers vested in an elected mayor that do not transfer to an acting mayor. And having an acting mayor for, for a longer period of time could potentially result in some um, complications as a result of that. It's one of the reasons why the line of March 5th has sort of been uh, declared. It, it's not an arbitrary date. There's sort of some thought behind it. Now, I'll happily concede the fact that um, it is likely that this change will happen on or around that date, which could further complicate things. Could be earlier, could be later. No one sim simply knows at this point. So I, I do you know, understand why the uh, author is bringing it before us now. Um, second of all, if we look at some precedent, certainly, I, I, while I wasn't elected, I, I certainly remember the 2007 rule. Um, I think that was the mistake of the council to uh, get rid of a preliminary election after the fact, um, because that certainly would benefit uh, players. And, and I appreciate the fact that the author of this father, the first Councilor Royal, recused himself from this vote, from that vote, um, because it was seen as something that that would obviously serve in his self-interest. Um, that's sort of the bottom line of the concern that I have with this: is that this vote, this action, would certainly benefit some, and in a time when there is such cynicism around government, around those in elective office, around those seeking elective office, I would hate to see that we're putting the thumb on the scale for anyone. Um, there is no doubt that COVID, that the pandemic, that barriers to voting um, is something that we need to deal with. And I was proud to have been one of the first elected officials in the state to call for vote by mail last year. And virtually all of you supported our efforts in the council. While we don't control uh, the state action, we played a large role, I would like to think, in making sure that we had as robust and safe and addressed every barrier to voting in both the state's primary election in September and the general election in November, and we were able to do so. And that's something that we ought to be replicating, whether there's a special election or not for mayor, whether there's an open mayor seat or not. That's something that I know that we're all committed to doing going into. And there will be a significant cost associated with it. Um, but I would argue that as we talk about precious funds, precious funds to spend on an election uh, is exactly what we should be spending money on. Democracy costs money to do it well, to address these barriers, to do it safely, to make sure that we have early vote, to make sure that we have vote by mail, to make sure that we're able to allow as much civic input in this important, important election is, is what we ought to be spending our money on. Uh, and so I'm committed to doing that no matter what the outcome of this is or no matter what the outcome of the timeline of the mayor or the acting mayor or anyone else seems to be. That's something that we have to be doing. So I want to remove that from the bucket because I think we're all in agreement on that. But I would just close by saying, and I appreciate you letting me go on a little bit, is that um, I have some concerns about this. I, it's concerns about changing the rule after the fact. We know the state legislature has done it as it relates to United States Senate seat several times back and forth. Um, we want to make sure that we are able to protect the integrity uh, of this body. I know that's something we all share. Uh, so I will certainly, I haven't had a chance to look at the revised language or to see what the difference in the revised language, which we just received with the original language. So 
but we'll certainly look at that and we'll certainly be engaged in this process. But I didn't want this opportunity to go by without raising some of my real concerns. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you to Councillor Arroyo for filing this. Um, I. Uh, when I first read the charter provisions here um, around Christmas, I think I had the similar reaction of, oh my gosh, four elections in a year. Um, seems like something uh, really to put our body politic through the ringer. Um, and uh, and then I think I, I also, that was sort of my first thought. And my second thought was kind of along the lines of what Councillor O'Malley just said, that even when something is inconvenient, you shouldn't change the rules in the middle of a process. It's always better to make charter and constitutional changes outside of the immediate application. Um, I think that this week I've sort of ended up at a third thought as it, it, as it were, which is that, you know, I think, I think where we really get stuck here, um, and Councillor O'Malley alluded to it, is that um, there are obvious political implications for folks who may be considering running for mayor. And I feel like as someone who is not running for mayor, um, I can say, you know, that if, you, if you're in a position where you've got more of an organization and more money um, pulled together, already, then you're likely to benefit in a special election. Um, if you're somebody thinking about um, running, um, also, if you were the acting mayor, you, you know, you'd be advantaged by canceling the special election. And I think we all know that those political realities are on the table and they make this a complicated conversation. I think that the way forward for us from a good government perspective is to think about it not from the perspective of potential candidates, but from the perspective of the voters um, and what do we owe the voters. Um, and I will say that my conversations with the election commissioner um, and with um, uh, and having heard some of the secretary of state's office's concerns are definitely leaning more in the direction of just that um, with COVID, the potential for the, the complications of recruiting for runs of poll workers, of getting out the language communications we would need to really make sure people are fully enfranchised, the fact that we don't have COVID election procedure is yet extended by the legislature through the period of the election, although I would certainly hope our friends in the legislature would do that. There are a lot of complications here. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Councillor O'Malley that cost should not be an object. I don't think that um, cost should stand in the way of good democracy, um, but I do think that, there, that we should acknowledge there are a large number of our constituents um, who feel like they would have a more safe and full opportunity to engage with potential candidates for mayor um, if they had a longer runway um, and and let's all hope and pray a runway with uh, less um, less COVID uh, incidents than we have right now. Um, so I just wanted to sort of acknowledge a bunch of the dimensions of the of the situation that I've been thinking about in weighing, um, and I and I think that um, it will be good for us to air those things in a hearing before taking a vote on this matter. Um, I, I also want to just flag one enduring um, uh, question for me on this is, it seems to me that there are a lot of arguments being made that are really about the idea that perhaps we should never have a special um, in a election year. The idea being, right, any time that a vacancy like this were to occur in the mayoral election year, that we would just punt it to the regular election. Um, and I, I think that if that is the main um, set of arguments that's underpinning this, that we should be looking really seriously at a, at a home rule that would make that permanent change to the charter, because I think that that would um, remove the argument that this is just a, a one-time sort of for one particular set of political circumstances. So those are the things that I'm weighing here, um, but I, I do just want to acknowledge that um, the more that I have talked to sort of the current election officials, um, the more I think that there are um, some pretty strong logistical arguments there, and that also the overlap of signature deadlines, a situation in which we would have a special still running while people were gathering signatures for a general, which they might or might not like right, need to sort of be candidates in, um, would create a strange set of things. And, and I think we also, um, we also have a challenge in Boston with the fact that we require a very large number of signatures in a short period of time. Um, and that it might come under COVID challenge, um, like a legal challenge because of the COVID restrictions. And so I think there's a lot for us to weigh here um, and uh, looking forward to a hearing on this. And I, I, I think it was the question on everyone's mind. So I really wanna commend Councillor Arroyo for bringing it to the body. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Councillor Mejia, are you with us? 
I will check back in with Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've thought about this a lot. Um, I don't have a dog in this in this in this race. Uh, if I were to have a dog in this race, it would benefit. And 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 let's be frank: that people are looking at this, how is it going to benefit them? And I and um, I, not being in that position, if this benefits me or or a candidate of of someone that I can get behind to have that election in September. That being said, I'm thrilled that my colleague is finally interested in city finances now, considering what he, the way he voted this, this past summer, but it's, it's good to see someone kind of grow and change. Um, I think it obviously sets up for, for someone to be in the driver's seat in this election. I, 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 have, so many, I have so many thoughts. I'd like to, if, if it wasn't a campaign, if it wasn't a, a violation of open meeting law, I'd like to know how some of the people that are the front runners on this body feel about it. And, and if they were able to push back on advocates, which would be one of my biggest concerns with this, with this next mayor's race, uh, uh, are, the, are people going to be able to um, be fair when it comes to dealing with advocates or are the advocates going to come in and just roll over the mayor's office? Um, I think that there's a reason why people right now don't like politicians because we're doing things like this where we, because we have the power to manipulate elections, are now going to manipulate elections. And even we, even though we say it's about finance and it's about COVID and it's about this, it's about who is our, who is our person in the race and how does it benefit them directly? I can't help but think that that is the underlying reason why this, this, um, this, this, um, special petitions in front of us. And has anybody thought about the state house on this here? It, it, don't they find it strange that now I've been on the body for almost, well, I'm in my 10th year. And every time we have us, uh, we have a uh, home rule petition go up there. Most of the time they just get lost. We can't find out what's going on with them. We can't get them passed. Now the state house is going to slam this through in a matter of weeks for us. Nobody thinks that that looks inappropriate. Nobody thinks that the, the state house has their own dog in this fight. So there's a whole lot of things that, that, that I think about in this one. Uh, another one, um, you know, we, we're handing the city and, and, you know, no disrespect to anybody, we're handing the city over to someone that has not been duly elected for 10 months. Not been duly elected to make decisions for the entire city of Boston for 10 months. I think that that's a problem. I think that this, this mayor's race will play out on the city council floor and we run the risk. This body here runs the risk of, of, of looking pretty bad this summer if it plays out the way, the way I, I may think it plays out. Um, so I have, a, I have a lot of current concerns. My gut, my heart is telling me the rules should stay the same when it, because it looks inappropriate, I think. That's just my sense on it. Again, I'm saying I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm benefited by pushing this off, to, off till September because in that way, if it's me that is going to run, I, I, I'm able to raise money. I'm able to do whatever. I mean, I have to think about it myself because I was called a potato-faced, mealy mouth mf -er on um, on Twitter today. So I, I must incite some sort of emotion in the city of Boston. So those are my thoughts. My, my, my heart and my gut, and I think the right thing to do here is, is to let's play by the rules and not just because we have the ability to change an election doesn't mean we should necessarily do it. Thank you, Madam President, and congratulations on your upcoming appointment. You're on mute, President Council. Thank you so much. It's bound to happen at least twice uh, every Zoom to somebody. Um, the, I'm recognizing you. The chair recognizes Councillor Mejia that you've rejoined us. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that little mishap. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that the rules have never been uh, created for folks uh, to succeed. Oftentimes, there's some people who benefit more 
from the current constructs, and that's what is at stake right now. So I don't think that we can, in good conscience, move with four elections in one year in the middle of a pandemic. We've done so much adjusting over the past year. We moved the council online. We shifted millions of COVID resources, all in the name of the service of the people. We owe it to the people. And this is all about the people because like Frank, I don't have any dog or any skin in this game either. And it's really about making sure that we create a pathway for all folks to be able to have a successful run. We owe it to them to also think about language access and resources. It, we, we already know that um, in the last election, um, in the last council election, we had a, a turnout of 17%. Let that sink in, 17% came out and voted. That is really something for us to ponder on. And this isn't about candidates, it's about the people. We literally have made history this year, right? And we're doing things and figuring things out as we go. If we have a special election after a special election, we're going to let a few thousand politically active people decide who will be the mayor of 700,000 people for the next four years. Because we already know what's up. Don't get it twisted here. We know who comes out in droves in special elections. It is not those who are mostly impacted by the decisions that are being made every single day. So let's just be really honest about who is really here to benefit um, from whatever happens. So I wholeheartedly support uh, moving forward um, so that we're not doing business as usual and that we take this opportunity to bend the, the rules in support yeah. of the people. Point of interest, Madam Chair, I don't know what's up. So, I mean, can someone break that down for me? Mayor, Mayor, can you break that down for me? Councillor Baker, you, you can have that conversation with Councillor Mejia outside of this meeting. Thank you very much. What did I say? Did I say something? I say what's up? Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, nope, I mean. we're not going there. Please, thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much to my colleagues. Um, I just wanted to note, I think I'm one of the few people here on in this body that's ever actually run in a special election, who actually knows what it feels like to have to gather, to get together, to get to know, to figure all these things out. And I just want to bring that up as, a, as, as that is informing some of my perspective on how this needs to get done. And I'm telling you, you do need the resources, not just financial, but in terms of the ability for the uh, city, uh, the elections department, um, also, just if for any candidate to have a, a for, for any candidate to truly feel that they are vetted by the community and to be out there, a special election really hurts those opportunities. That's those are that's that's from personal experience. That being said, I'm now today the chair of government ops for the city of Boston, and so I just wanted to make sure that people understand actually what we're talking about. We kind of walked right into this and didn't really explain. I think in the 30,000 foot view, what is before us. So for those who are unfamiliar, this we are specifically discussing section 13 of our Boston City Charter, our city constitution, if you will. Section 13 does not provide an option in this moment. It is a shall provision that there shall be a special election if the mayor lives, leaves within 16 months of the of a prior municipal election. For those who are unaware, that would make it March 5th of this year. So if the mayor of Boston vacates, vacates the office, not just temporarily leaves, which he does often, and then during that time, Council President Janey takes over as the mayor. But if he vacates his office, then we shall have a special election pursuant to our city constitution. That special election must happen within 120 days after we shall produce an order from the city city council. I've said it to some of my colleagues, and I'll say this pu publicly. If the mayor of Boston leaves, vacates before March 5th, I will write and introduce the order to the city council for a special election. I'm saying that now. I'm going to follow the city's charter. 
Council Royo is also following the city's charter and the laws of the Commonwealth, where if we are going to change any aspect of it, as I, as you know, I duly know, <laughs> to change the charter, there is a process for that. And he has entered that process. That is what is before us. I appreciate Councillor Bach and Councillor Royo mentioning their, their private conversations with the uh, Secretary of State and with the Elections Department, but let's be very clear as government ops, this is a public conversation. So summaries of what people have said are difficult, isn't sufficient. It is not transparent. It's not how we do things. The reason why I hope this is assigned to my council or to my committee is because we will have a transparent, open conversation about whether this makes sense for us right now. You have my commitment, and I have said this many times to my colleagues, over shorter deadlines introduced by other more emergency or more urgent um, uh, excuse me, provisions for our, to protect our housing, I can get it done. I, by that, I mean get the conversation going, get something and getting us to consensus, and then ultimately together getting uh, something out of the city council, if it should come out of the city council. So I'm telling the public the process is that if this is assigned to my committee at government ops, we will then have a hearing. During that hearing, we get to hear then all these perspectives that are summarized by Councilor Bach and, and Councilor Arroyo. And I, I apologize, Councilor, uh, uh, to both those councillors. That is not just your summary. Uh, the Secretary of State did come out in the Boston Globe. But I also think, and I would invite, as Councilor O'Malley and I did before, for the Secretary of State to come this time. Or maybe he comes this time to say something to us specifically about his concerns. Now, during that hearing, we also can entertain edits and suggestions in language to this home rule petition as well. This is, this is a public conversation that we have been called to do. And it's true, it's a difficult time to have it. But there are edits on the table, there's opposition on the table, there's reasons why we should pass this all on the table. It's a conversation that will happen publicly. After that, we can have and should have a working session. I am saying this because I don't want people to think I'm playing politics with the timing of this. I do this. I, this is how I do things. You have seen this before. Even when the mayor of Boston wanted me to suspend and pass, I still said I'm going to have a hearing and a working session for my colleagues and for the public to participate. That is my commitment as well to this moment, too. I do not have a dog in this fight. I do not want to be Mayor Boston. And good luck to those who really want to. I don't know why. But it's your dream. It's your life. YOLO, whatever the hell the kids say. Do it. But in this moment, we're going to maintain the order, the process, the transparency that this moment calls for. And we will have a robust hearing on this. I just wanted to finally conclude to let people know the way the process works if this were to come out of our body, which requires a seven vote, seven people to vote for it, the mayor of Boston would have to still sign it. After he signs it, it would then have to go to the state house. It would have to get to the House and the Senate, and then still pass and be signed by the governor. This is a process. This is the process that we are in. So I just want people to be transparent about that. Um, and how I expect um, to proceed with this process, what I will do if the mayor does leave before the 5th, and just let everyone know there is no special bending, working around and trying to manipulate. We have legal procedures. We are all following them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I would just say, Madam President, I would just say uh, I appreciate the thought that the body is all approaching this with, the, the amount of thought they're putting into it. And what I would say is uh, I put this on the floor and I, I'm arguing for this and I'm supporting this, not because I'm running for mayor. I'm not running for mayor, just in case anybody was confused on that point. Uh, but because I represent the residents and constituents of District 5, and I'll be on the ballot for District 5. And the reality is, in all of what I've heard, I didn't hear anything saying these realities that I expressed about disenfranchisement, about COVID, about 
financial resources going where they really don't need to go, uh, the impracticality of organizing and scheduling four elections for the same seat in one year. Nobody said you're wrong. Nobody said that's not true. Nobody said that won't happen. What I've heard is speculation about whether or not this helps one potential possible candidate or whether or not this hurts or helps one other potential possible candidate. And I would say that the city of Boston and its residents aren't served by that. They're served by us looking at the realities on the ground and how this affects the regular residents in the city of Boston. And I would also just note uh, that I agree with having a hearing on this and having the election department come and speak on this. I want that. I'm not seeking a vote on this today. I want that kind of clarity and transparency and I'm seeking that, and I and I applaud Councillor Edwards for ensuring that that will happen in a robust way. Uh, but I will also note that we we have a clock and it's ticking, and March 5th is not that far away. And so my hope is that when we can do the work we need to do, uh, all of it, there no no slipping or sliding on any of the rules that we have to follow. This will go by the letter of the law. We will do this in the way we have to do this. It will be a public and transparent process, and that we really act because we know that these realities are real. Nobody's discounting any of these harms that will befall the city of Boston. They're simply saying that they're speculating about whether or not it helps one person be the next mayor or if it hurts some other person be the next mayor. And frankly, to me, that's all wildly irrelevant. I am deeply concerned about the impacts that this will have on the residents of the city of Boston if we do not act. Uh, and so I look forward to that hearing. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you so much. Not seeing any uh, speakers for this, a show of physical hands for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, would you please add Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach, and Councillor Braden. Um, Docket 0155 will be referred to the Committee of Government Operations. Madam Clerk, we'll move on to- Madam Talk President, can you add me? Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you please add um, Councilor Campbell? Certainly. Um, we will now move on to Docket 0156. Docket 0156, Councilor Arroyo offered the following order for hearing to audit the implementation of the Invest in Boston Ordinance. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Invest in Boston, uh, is, other than being just incredibly timely and something that would have been very helpful uh, in this and during this pandemic and the financial situation we find ourselves in, is already the law. It was an ordinance passed in 2013 and signed by, uh, well, actually, it was a vetoed and it was overridden. Uh, the issue is it, it doesn't seem to have been implemented. And so this was an audit called to ensure the implementation of Invest in Boston. Uh, it's an ordinance near and dear to my heart, as it's one that my brother, uh, Councillor Felix Arroyo uh, saw through, and I believe folks on this body uh, voted for, frankly. Uh, and so my hope is that we can get uh, an update on how this will be implemented, why it wasn't implemented, and, and how quickly we can see it implemented, uh, because I truly do believe that Invest in Boston uh, is great for the city. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I couldn't agree more with the previous speaker. Uh, also, we had something years ago when I started on the council it was called Bank on Boston that paid great dividends where we had all the lending institutions come forward uh, in partnership with the city uh, in an effort to identify uh, their practices. Uh, and we made it clear that anyone that wanted to do business with the city of Boston, uh, that their banking practices had to take into consideration uh, our concerns uh, across the city in every neighborhood. So uh, happy to uh, please add my name, uh, Madam President, and obviously we'll look forward to working with the lead sponsor uh, and share with him some of the thoughts that I had from uh, being having a front row seat with uh, Bank on Boston. And uh, let's try to see if we can uh, make this a reality for uh, what we're dealing with. He, he, he nailed it when he said have uh, had it been in place, uh, we'd be seeing uh, an op we'd have an opportunity to tend to dig out from from the pandemic a lot quicker. So that said, look forward to working with him. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. I um, wanted to thank Councilor Arroyo for uh, filing this um, and uh, and just say I, uh, you know, I serve on the board of MAHA and it's an interest of um, great interest to sort of the whole community of groups that have grown up thinking about 
about the long history of bank discrimination in the city um, and how we uh, really reverse that. And I think Invest in Boston was designed to do that. Um, I know that when I dug into it, um, a while back, it seemed like the city was doing some of the reporting and following up with the banks that the um, ordinance calls for, but that we aren't necessarily broadcasting it in the ways that we need to, and that the Municipal Banking Commission called for by the Act is not um, in operation. So I think I'm looking forward to this hearing. I think uh, the good news is that I think we have been on some of the banks that hold deposits for the city uh, to really um, follow some of the things proposed in the act. But I think obviously it's important to us as counselors in our oversight role for what we're doing to be transparent um, and both to us and to the public. So looking forward to the hearing and please add my name, Madam Clerk. Thank you so much, Councilor Bach. Not seeing any other speakers or show of physical hands. To add your name, Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Malley, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Braden, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Wu. Did I get everyone who wants to be added? Please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0156 will be referred to the Committee of, of Post Audit and uh, Oversight. We will now move on to docket 0157, Madam Clerk. Docket 0157, Councilors Arroyo and Braden offer the following order for hearing to discuss promoting public safety and better outcomes for young adults by raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction from 18 to 21. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh Madam President, to be clear, <clears throat> the City Council doesn't have the ability to raise the age uh, of juvenile jurisdiction, but the state is currently considering it. Uh, and this is obviously an issue of uh, great interest and importance to me, uh, but also to the City of Boston, as, as our youth would also uh, benefit uh, from these kinds of uh, conversations. And, and just one brief thing that I will say is that studies have shown that individuals are, who are allowed to stay in juvenile ju jurisdiction until they are at least 21, have reduced recidivism, and, improve, and it has improved uh, public safety outcomes in uh, communities that have attempted this. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to having a robust conversation uh, and, and, and having all these points raised, both for and against. Thank you. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I, I want to thank Councilor Arroyo for his leadership on this initiative. Um, as the chair of the Committee on Strong Women, Families and Communities, uh, I'm committed to working with our colleagues to better understand and address the disparities and in, in, in inequities in our youth um, juvenile justice system. Uh, and I fully support raising the age of juvenile uh, justice from uh, 18 to 21. And I really look forward to having a robust conversation about this issue and um, and bringing in uh, advocates and community partners so that we can raise awareness of um, the how, how this approach will improve outcomes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Wu, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Edwards, Anyone else? Did I miss anyone? Uh, could you please also add the chair, docket one, docket 0157 will be referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We'll move on to docket 0158. Thank you. Docket 0158, Councillors O'Malley and Campbell offer the following order for hearing to discuss racial disparities in the field interrogation and observation, FIO, data, by the Boston Police Department. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as this is a refile, I will too endeavor to be brief. Uh, suffice it to say, rather than going through the talking points that I know many of us know, I'm delighted to again partner with the District Council for Mattapan and Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice on this very, very important issue, uh, one that she's taken uh, leadership on uh, for many, many years uh, in this body. And before that, uh, we all know that the data after 2019 uh, collection illustrated that close to 70% of field stops uh, were of uh, black and brown individuals. 
individuals, uh, despite the fact that uh, the correlation is about 25% of the city's population. Uh, what gets measured gets managed, uh, so we need to make sure that we're able to collect the data, the policies in place as we talk about reimagining public safety going forward. Uh, this is a crucial, crucial step. So uh, thank again, Councillor Campbell, for her leadership and partnership on this and look forward to continuing the work in the new year. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. No, thank you, Madam President. Obviously, I'm grateful for the partnership with Council O'Malley. Yes, a refile. Looking forward to having this hearing, which is critically important as we talk about the data, but then most importantly, get into the work of changing policy and practice so the inequities don't continue to persist. So thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Council O'Malley. Thank you so much. Uh, would anyone like to sign on to this docket? Show a physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Wu, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Braden. Did I get everyone? Councillor Flynn? Anyone else? Please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0158 will be referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Moving on to Docket 0159. Docket 0159, Councillor Campbell offered the following order for hearing regarding auto, automobile insurance rates in Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam President. Obviously, this is a refile. We will continue this conversation. Um, I would hope, actually, that we can try to schedule it in such a way that we can get all co colleagues there, because it is a major issue in terms of disparities that people are seeing. Um, and we learned a lot from this hearing. The AG's office as well, I want to thank them for the partnership, because they've been doing incredible work here to help our residents save money, uh, given the inequities in outer in insurance rates. So looking forward to this hearing. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Would anyone like to add their name? Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Wu, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Braden, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Flaherty. Anyone else looking to add their name? Did I miss you? Councillor Edwards, please add, add Councillor Edwards. Please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0159 will be referred to the Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development. At this time, I would ask for the Vice Chair uh, to take over as I am on the next docket. Thank you so much. The Chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley, who will now uh, preside over the meeting. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please place before the body docket 0160? Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Docket 0160, Councilors Janey and Arroyo offer the following resolution calling for the removal of Donald J. Trump from the Office of President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The chair now recognizes a president we can be proud of, uh, the president of the City Council, Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I would like to um, ask to suspend Rule 12 and add uh, Councillor Edwards as an original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections to the suspension of Rule 12, Councillor Edwards is hereby added. Thank you so much. And uh, Vice Chair O'Malley, before I go on, I would like to just call for a brief moment of silence to recognize those who lost their lives in Washington, D.C. last week. Of course, Madam President, uh, we, will, we will now have a brief moment of silence. Thank, thank you for that, Madam President. Please proceed. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I want to thank Councillor Arroyo and Councillor Edwards for partnering me, partnering with me on this resolution calling to remove the occupant of the White House as President of the United States for his role in inciting a violent insurrection against the United States Capitol on January 6th. It shook me to my core, as I know it did all of you and for so many Americans watching. I was stunned to see what was happening at our nation's capital. Stunned, shocked even, but not surprised. For weeks, we saw Trump embolden his followers and co-conspirators to be violent and divisive on different platforms and social media. 
and to encourage the supporters of his to block the certification of President-elect Biden's win. And it was not only Trump, but several Senate and House Republicans were complicit in this. It must be held accountable. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that the reaction that we saw last Wednesday looked very different than what we saw over the summer when protesters were, were demanding justice. Um, and it's very unfortunate that we are still living in a time where we see these stark differences. This was a threat to our democracy, and that threat is still alive. We have to protect our democracy. We have to ensure that our electoral process, that um, our, our constitution, that, that that is protected. That is fundamental to who we are as a nation. And while I know we all support free speech, we know that this was a violent insurrection where the, the president told his supporters to stay strong, to fight, told them to go to the Capitol. This is the nation that we are living in, and we've got to get to a place where there is true healing. And so we've got to seek justice. We've got to hold folks accountable. We have to support our colleagues in government in Washington, D.C., in the call for the removal of the occupant. And so I will end there, uh, but ask my colleagues to sign on and support this resolution. And obviously, we'll be asking for suspension of the rules and adoption of this resolution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Chair now recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> it's difficult to contextualize <clears throat> the moment we find ourselves in today. Uh, I think like many, the images from the Capitol uh, will remain with me forever. Uh, the thoughts of what this country is currently experiencing, uh, though something that could have been speculated on, and, and I think certainly was, was not something that I think anybody honestly, truly expected to become as real today as it is. And so, you know, I never thought that I would say that the sitting president of the United States of America uh, is a threat to our democracy uh, and a threat to our public safety and our national security. Uh, and yet I find myself in a position today to do that. Uh, and it's for those reasons, it's for uh, what has been done and what could still be done that I am calling upon and, and why I'm part of uh, this resolution, uh, calling for the removal of uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, he's disgraced that office. He's disgraced this country. Uh, and what he's done will be a permanent stain uh, on the history of our nation. And it is my hope, my sincerest hope, uh, that those who have the power to act do. Uh, and in that frame of mind, uh, we have the power to do this. And so that's what I hope we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes the district council from East Boston. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much to my colleagues. I wanted to note that this is also part of the rules that are allowed at the federal government, and we're simply asking that the government, uh, federal government, follow its rules. Uh, it seems like the rule, um, the 25th Amendment, may, may not be an option. So, therefore, uh, impeachment proceedings are a way of which to remove the president is an option. And I, this is the reason why I'm standing up and for this resolution that I encourage the federal government to impeach and to ultimately remove. Um, Donald Trump from the office of the presidency of the United States. 
This is also a solidarity move for our former sister in service, Councilor, or excuse me, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who I believe has faced a ridiculous amount of threats to her personal safety since the day she took office. And it only increased and has been only flamed by the President of the United States. And to hear her accounting and to know what fear was placed upon her and any other member of Congress, but especially because she is ours, makes me extremely angry. But also, we are Boston and we stick by our own. And to be very frank, one of ours was threatened in D.C. And I believe, without a doubt, because of the at the president's election and at his encouragement. Now, I am sitting here supporting this resolution simply because I, I also think that we need to stand up and call a thing a thing. We need to say when someone had tried to threaten the United States, created treason, not just of, and threatening one of our friends, that we need to stand up and say, we do not support that and think you need to stand down and you stand back and get the heck out of the office. We as a nation had already said we are no longer going to continue him as a president. He has decided he, in his uh, incredible maturity, won't even attend the inauguration. He has checked out. He is no longer wanting to do the job. People are dying of COVID. He is no longer leading. But most importantly, he is happily enabling the destruction and safety of our country. So I also think why import, impeachment especially is important is my understanding of those rules. He would not be able to run again. And so that is also an important thing because I think one of the greatest threats that he has ever committed to this country is his access to and using social media and a platform to, to dispel horrible lies, to dispel horrible conspiracies, and to amplify and enable uh, bigotry and also um, violent acts. He has done that as the president of the United States. What a shameful thing. What a shameful thing that any president would do that. So I'm calling for his removal, essentially also calling on the Congress to do its job and hopefully impeach him this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Edwards. Uh, the chair now recognizes the district council from South Boston. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, um, please add my name and I just want to echo what my colleagues have already stated. Um, maybe one, one point I, I would like to add, uh, Mr. Vice President, it is several years ago when Trump was campaigning for president, he, he made fun of a gentleman, I think it was a reporter, that had cerebral palsy um, on he made fun of him at a campaign rally, but for someone to make fun of a person with disability would, in my opinion, would disqual disqualify that person from any position in elective office, never mind, never mind presidency. And when I, when I think of the harsh treatment he had against, he has against immigrants, I, always, I still think of the, the way the Irish immigrants were treated when they came over. And now there's a new, group of immigrants that are that are here with us and just the disdain that he has for our immigrants really in my opinion disqualifies someone for elective office as well and then, then finally mr vice president um i know he's i know he's a, from a different political party but um senator mccain but to make fun of his um what to degrade his military service after being shot down and and serving as a prisoner of war for six to seven years uh, to make fun of and discredit his military service, especially for someone that never served in the military, um, is disdainful as well and something um, that really, really bothers me. So please add my name and um, thank you to the sponsors for, for this resolution. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Uh, Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Ed Flynn as a co-sponsor. The chair now recognizes the district council from Beacon Hill. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Councilor O'Malley, and thank you to my colleagues for filing this. I just want to join in condemning um, the president's actions on the 6th and to say that I think that he should be impeached and convicted, um, and it should happen today. It should have happened last week. I mean, I think I... I was seized by fear on the 6th. Um, Councillor Edwards has already spoken to um, our uh, Congresswoman 
Ayanna Presley, who was in harm's way, many members of our delegation. Um, I have a lot of friends who are congressional staffers. They don't make much money. They try to serve the people of this country. There's a lot of people who are janitors in that building, as we saw, who are Capitol Police officers, who are just going about their day um, trying to serve this country. And, you know, politics is the way that we handle our disagreements instead of violence. That's, that's really the whole activity here is that we know we don't all always agree on things. We've got big decisions to make. We've got big challenges to face and we figure out how to um, have elections and debates and deliberations to deal with how we're gonna make those decisions. Um, and when a president crosses that line into violence because the appropriate procedures and systems of the democracy are not resulting in what he wants, that is a complete undermining of, of every aspect of our institutions. Um, and I feel as though we have, um, we have found ourselves using more and my, more hyperbole over these last four years. And then somehow now it's like, we don't even have the words to say as strongly as we need um, how completely wrong this is, how exactly this is what is contemplated when we think about things that would be treasonous, insurrectionist against um, the really, really very spirit of our democracy. And so I just, um, I, I want to, in the strongest terms, join this today, um, say that I, I hope that he is impeached and convicted. I think the idea that he directed a violent mob at a co-equal branch of government is, is, a, is a breathtakingly awful thing. And one, and I, and I also just think the last thing I'll say is, I think what weighs so heavy about it for me is that, you know, that that line, that difference between politics and violence in our society, like we only maintain that through norms. We only maintain that through just the norms of how we treat each other, those invisible lines that we don't cross. Um, I think there's a lot of really troubling questions about why the Capitol was not better defended from a security perspective on the 6th. Um, and I strongly agree with the view that um, that if these protesters had been black, they would have been met completely differently. Um, and that in many ways, the, the motivating action of the protesters um, and the response they were met uh, with is our symptoms of white supremacy. But I think it's also important to note that there, there's a deeper problem even, which is that there is no way for our democracy to be safeguarded completely and protected by adequate security measures. Democracy is only protected by the norms that we don't attack each other, that we decide we're gonna do these things in our legislative halls um, and not with weapons and not through physical intimidation um, and threats to people's lives. So I, this is a brink that we are sliding over and that we just have to do everything um, to come back from. And so when people talk about unity in this moment, the unity has to be in the direction of saying, hell no, we will not go over that edge. So thank you. Thank you so much to the sponsors and add my name. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Bach as a co-sponsor. Uh, seeing and hearing, or seeing no further blue hands, um, obviously chairing the hearing uh, prohibits me from weighing on something before us, but suffice it to say, I agree with everything that has been said. Please add the chair's name, Madam Clerk. Please add Councilor Saibi George's name. Please add Councillor Liz Braden. Please add Councillor Julia Mejia. Please add Councillor Andrea Campbell. Please add Councillor Michael Flaherty. Please add Councillor Michelle Wu. Please add Councillor Frank Baker. Uh, and obviously, we've already added Councillors Flynn, Bach, and the three sponsors, uh, Council President, Council Royal, and Councillor Edwards. Uh, Council President, on behalf of a unified council, seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of Docket 1060. Madam Clerk, would you please call, ca please call the roll? Thank you. Docket 0160, Councillor Arroyo. Yes. Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Bach. Yes. Councillor Bach, yes. Councillor Braden. Yes. Councillor Braden, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. 
Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket 0160 has received unanimous approval and it, the resolution is adopted unanimously. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Madam President. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley, and please thank Margo for her patience. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Clerk, we will now move on to docket 0161. Could you please read that into the record? Certainly. Docket 0161, Councillors Flynn and Bach offered the following order for hearing to discuss the proliferation of electronic billboards in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, along with Councilor Bach, we filed this hearing order to discuss the uh, proliferation of electronic billboards in our city, as we have seen an increase of electronic billboard proposals in recent years. There are a couple of big concerns about electronic billboards that we have. One of the uh, big ones, I think, is the uh, distracted driving and pedestrian safety. Studies have shown a link between billboards and accidents. Electronic billboards also cause light pollution and can negatively impact nearby residents' quality of life and their ability to sleep at night. We had electronic billboard proposals in Chinatown and downtown in recent years, and they were pro opposed by the residents because of those reasons. The potential distraction for drivers, light pollution, and the need to preserve the character of our neighborhoods. We filed this hearing to discuss this matter to control electronic billboards in the city of Boston and how we can strengthen the zoning code in response to the increase of electronic billboards. For some reason, my neighborhood in Chinatown, everyone wants to put a billboard up in Chinatown. And as long as I'm a city councilor, I'm going to continue advocating against it. But the issue is not going away. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Councilor Bach for joining me. Uh, this is an important issue and looking forward to the hearing. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. And thank you to my colleague, uh, Councilor Flynn, for his leadership on this. Um, I'm happy to be a partner in it. Um, and also, I think for both of us to be partners with the Association of Downtown Community Organizations, um, so many of whom have been pushing to really take a look at this. And, and I think an important thing to stress here is that as, as so many of us experience as counselors, you know, sometimes there are these quality of life issues for our communities and the way that we have to deal with them ends up being a game of whack-a-mole at the ZBA, right? So it's like every week is something filed. Um, and that's sort of what we've been experiencing in uh, my district and Councillor Flynn's around these electronic billboards. Um, and it's, it's doubly frustrating because our zoning code is quite clear about these being a forbidden use in all but uh, three small zones. And, um, and I think that rather than us sort of playing that game of whack-a-mole and then inevitably eventually missing one and having um, the proliferation of this really kind of uh, seep in, I think it's important for us to have a serious conversation in a hearing um, about what we want for the city of Boston and what we want for our historic neighborhoods. Councillor Flynn has made um, many of the points that I would make. Um, they do, I think, denigrate the sort of aesthetic experience of our neighborhood, but more importantly, there's just a lot of core uh, city policy goals they cut against. So they use energy at a time that we're trying to reduce that. Um, they, you know, they do, they cause distracted driving and they put our pedestrians at risk at a time when we are trying to achieve vision zero, right, which is the goal of having no pedestrian deaths in the city, a goal which we have already missed this year. I mean, just uh, allow that to sink in. It's like we, we have got to make this a safer city and and distraction is such a dominant aspect of our culture right now. And um, so I really think there's this major safety concern. And then I also think, and we all know this in the time of COVID, that all of our lives are spent on screens. Um, and I have heard from so many constituents about what a saving grace it is to be outdoors in our public spaces in the city and to have a chance to rest their eyes um, and, and enjoy the fresh air. And I don't think that we should be commodifying 
the outdoor experience um, in Boston even more dramatically by having electronic billboards that are being designed in order to grab your attention and hold it in exactly the same way as these devices are um, and so much of the rest of our lives. So this is just one of those things that, um, you know, we could continue to let it boil along as a kind of one by one applications issue, or we could elevate it as we're trying to do with this hearing to be more of a policy issue about what we want the built environment of the city to look like um, and really reflect our constituents' concerns. So thank you again to Councillor Flynn, who's really been the leader on this. I'm happy to join him um, and uh, grateful to my colleagues. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Baker. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to thank um, you know the District 3 and the District 8 councils for bringing this forward. Um, billboards are something I've been fighting in in my district my entire time on the council and Council George would be able to speak to this also our time when we were at Columbia Savin Hill and all the different Dorchester groups. Billboards, billboards were originally placed around the city by executives that looked at the city of Boston as a decaying place. Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, they, they advertised alcohol and tobacco to our children for years and years and years. And now they're trying to pivot and switch and make it all digital and, and more in Chinatown, more in town and downtown. I don't think we want to look for the, I, I mean, there's a lot that Manhattan I think does okay and does, does good, but I don't think that we necessarily speaking about downtown want to have a Times Square type thing. And what's happening with me is I have all the billboards along the highway. The money that the money that comes into the billboard companies and to the, the landlords there, you're talking about if a, a landlord goes from maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year for a for a um for a paper billboard, they're at a million dollars a year potentially along along the highway. So it's big, big money. And dealing with these billboard companies, they're not willing to take anything down. They'll take down two and three here. I've been dealing with them for 10 years. And and and, and if and I would say to them, if you want billboards in District 3, then go through and take everything off Dorchester Ave, take everything off Columbia Road, take everything off Bowdoin Street, take everything off Blue Hill. And then maybe the city of Boston has a couple of them on the highway, and we have a good we have a good mitigation package with those billboard companies. They all play games. They all uh, it's huge, huge money. So I, I I'm just thrilled about this, and want to thank again the, the the two district councils that put this forward. Thank you, and sign me on. Thank you so much, Councillor Baker. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have. Uh Thank you, Madam President. I want to echo um, the concerns and, and thank my colleagues, uh, Councillor Flynn and Councillor Bach, for raising up this very important issue. Um, like um, Councillor Baker, uh, uh, the, the Mass Pike uh, cuts through the centre of our neighbourhood in Alston Brighton, and uh, there's a proliferation, or has been, uh, many uh, billboards along, along the Mass Pike that... Um, are in our neighbourhoods that cause light pollution and uh, distraction. And I really feel this is an important discussion to have. Um, I would love to say that if it, it is a for, forbidden use. It is a forbidden use, and I don't understand why we have this constant whack-a-mole um, approach to trying to get variances for these um, these these um, these billboards in our neighbourhoods. So thank you very much, and I look forward to this hearing. Please add my name. Thank you so much. The chair uh, recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, please have my name. Uh, hopefully, that uh, there's some way to have the name Joe Chase on uh, to this amendment. I know Madam Clerk and my colleagues from Dorchester will know the great work that the late uh, Joe Chase on did on this uh, in, in this space. But also wanted to raise another issue. I don't know if you've noticed, but on the tops of buildings, you're starting to see like the names of companies, the indoor, their logo. Um, fixed uh, a fixed high up on the top of the building, top floor, top few floors. So I think that ought to be thrown into the mix as well. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we're starting to see the skyline change. A lot of buildings uh, either out of the ground or coming out of the ground, but I'm not quite sure what the rule is around that. I think it must be something that's maybe related to this, uh, but it seems as though whoever occupies a significant amount of the square footage and or uh, has a, a serious or lengthy lease uh, somehow they're getting to be able to affix uh, the name of their company outside of the building, um, uh, high up in the air. So 
I just think that warrants uh, a knock on the door to find out what the rules are and who gets to put the name up and who doesn't and whether or not we even want the, a whole skyline, uh, particularly around the South Boston waterfront and or and around the downtown because like once the precedent is set, uh, who gets to say you can and you can't anymore. So that said, I look forward to a hearing on this and please have my name in, brother. Thank you so much. A show of physical hands for those who want to sign on to this docket. Madam Clerk, if you would please add, uh, you have Councillor Flaherty, Councillor uh, Wu, uh, Councillor Braden, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Edwards. Did I get everyone? Anyone else? Please also add the chair. Um, this is docket 0161 and it will be referred to the Committee of City and Neighborhood Services. We will now move on to the next docket. Madam Clerk, if you would please read uh, docket 0162. Thank you. Docket 0162, Council of Flynn offered the, uh, the following order for hearing to discuss the creation of a frontline worker COVID-19 health registry. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council of Flynn. Council of Flynn, you have a floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, may I add Council of Flaherty as an original co-sponsor? Seeing and hearing no objections, Council of Flaherty is so added. I will encourage if you are just adding a second co-sponsor to do it prior to the filing of the docket when it's going to the clerk's office so that they that second co-sponsor just appears on the docket whenever possible. But thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Flaherty has been added. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, this is a, a refile from last year, so I will, I will be very brief. Um, a, a registry for our first responders, such as police, fire, EMS, healthcare workers. Um, it's critical that we track the impact COVID-19 has on health, on their health and well-being um, of these first responders, frontline workers and their families, really. A health registry can conduct surveys and research um, and allow public health officials to better understand and access direct and impact uh, the virus has played. Madam President, I've, I'm part of a Gulf War registry uh, that I frequently go to examinations at the VA for my um, service in the Persian Gulf War, and it's for toxins that I was exposed to. But I do know that um, our frontline workers might also be exposed to um, unknown health risks associated with COVID-19. And it's important that we make sure that we track them, but also to provide the best medical care that we can to our frontline workers, our dedicated city workers. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Madam President, thank you. Uh, thanks to the lead sponsor for including me. I know he's done great work in the space. Um, I know that uh, the impacts of COVID-19 will continue to be felt for months if not years to come. And I think this registry, although an, uh, be a significant undertaking, could go a long way in helping demonstrate that we're grateful for their hard work and dedication during this extraordinarily difficult time, but also to be able to use that information uh, in the future, that tracking data, um, particularly for the frontline responders is critical for us to have. And also a broader conversation, uh, particularly as it pertains to city employees, many of whom uh, who were exposed through no fault of their own just because of the function of their job and uh, have had to burn through their sick time, their retirement time, have had to go on FMLA and or workers comp, um, getting only a certain percentage of what they should be getting in their regular weekly check. Lots of moving parts here, lots of issues that I think we need to talk to the budget office as well as uh, personnel uh, as well to get some, uh, some more information. But I think that having the registry would be a great start to, to draw attention to those issues as well. Thank you, Madam President. You're muted, Madam President. You're muted. Is that number two and number three? I apologize. Um, show of physical hands for anyone who wants to add their name. Uh, please add uh, Councillor O'Malley and Margo. Please add uh, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Braden. Please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Wu, Councillor Campbell. Please add Councillor Asabi George. Did I get everyone who would like to add their name? Would you please also add the chair, Madam Clerk? Docket 0162, 
We refer to the Committee of Public Health. We'll move on to Docket 0163. Docket 0163, Councilors Flynn and Flaherty offer the following order for hearing to discuss establishing a traffic master plan for South Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, this is a brief file. I'll be very, very brief. Um, what I would like to do is um, have a discussion about a comprehensive holistic master plan that accounts for the impact of large scale developments taking place in South Boston so we can better prepare um, traffic and pedestrian safety related issues. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to again thank Council Flynn for his partnership and echo those comments. In addition, uh, we also have residents in every part of uh, the city spending hours at BPDA meetings and about his meetings, evaluating both huge development projects and smaller scale projects. And a common theme that is discussed at each and every one of those meetings is, is our infrastructure able to handle the increases in traffic density uh, that all of these projects will be bringing to those respective communities? So there have been a, there's been a ton of planning initiatives around transit uh, improvements hosted by the BPDA. And I think many, many engaged residents uh, that call and email all of us regularly uh, with respect to uh, you know uh, what the master plan is, and I think that this hearing will uh, will uh, go a long way in allowing us to have a public discussion about uh, what planning initiatives have been undertaken. And I look forward to uh, hopefully an expedited hearing, working with uh, our colleague Council Flynn. But this is really important. I know that uh, Council Baker uh, and Council Sabi Jewett have a big project uh, happening, literally right in their backyard. All of us, uh, you, Madam President, and others. So uh, this is sort of an all hands on deck. Um, you know. Uh, uh, master traffic plans are critical. Uh, uh, Boston's bones, if you're not our infrastructure, our streets, our roads, our bridges, they're old. Uh, and we continue to keep adding to that. And in order to keep up with those improvements and that investment, you know, uh, planning initiatives uh, have to keep pace as well as making sure that we have pedestrian and cycle safety worked into that, as well as our intersections, our crosswalks, and, uh, and our light signal. So thank you, Madam President. Look forward to the hearing. Thank you so much. Uh, show of physical hands for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Wu, Councilor Baker, Councilor Royal, Councilor Cyber George, Councilor Campbell. Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0163 will be referred to the Committee of Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read Docket 0164? Docket 0164, Council of Flynn offers the following order for hearing to discuss property taxes and assistance programs for seniors and long-term residents facing difficulties during COVID-19. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council of Flynn. Council of Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, property taxes are a heavy financial burden for many families, especially seniors on fixed income. Um, many who have bought their homes years ago uh, when the house, housing prices were very low. Uh, with COVID-19 pandemic, many are also facing additional financial difficulties and may not be able to afford paying their property taxes. The City of Boston offers a number of property tax exemption for residents who qualify, including seniors who meet income limits and residency requirements. I was proud to work with Councilor Edwards as the original co-sponsor to pass an ordinance in the city council to allow low-income senior homeowners who owe back taxes to establish property tax agreements and get interest relief from the city. But uh, Madam President, this is a way to um, talk to our professionals in the assessing department and come up with a plan to see how we can continue to work with residents who are financially struggling especially our, our seniors, persons on disability. A lot, of, a lot of families are struggling to make ends meet, and uh, we just want to see what we can do to be helpful on this, um, on this regard. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you uh, so much. Show of hands for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Baker, Councilor Wu, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Royo, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Mejia, Councilor, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Flaherty, 
Did I get everyone who wants to add their name? Please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0164 will be referred to the Committee of Ways and Means, and we will move on to Docket 0165, please. Thank you. Docket 0165, Councils Flynn and Campbell offer the following order for hearing to discuss ways for the city to prevent and investigate incidents of hate crimes and discrimination. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Yeah, th thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, could I suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Olivia Edwards as an original co-sponsor. Thank you. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Edwards is added as an original co-sponsor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Ma Madam President, this is a refiling hearing order to discuss the ways our city can investigate and prevent incidents of hate crimes and discrimination in our city. Um, in the city of Boston, we have different departments that interact with constituents who experience discrimination, incidents, or violence. In particular, the, the, the Human Rights Commission, which was established in 1984 under Mayor Flynn to guarantee all residents are given fair and equal treatment under the law, and also to investigate and report on complaints related to discrimination. It was inactive for a period of time, but reactivated under Mayor Walsh in, um, in 2019. Um, I'm looking forward to having a hearing on ways we can continue to work with um, our residents, but to make sure that we document all cases of discrimination, document all cases of hate crimes, and to work with the appropriate city authorities to make sure that we also educate residents about, about what their rights are as it relates to if they are a victim of, hate, of a hate crime and how they can report it as well. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you so much. The chair now recognizes Councillor Campbell. I'll be brief. Just uh, thank you, Councillor Flynn and Councillor Edwards for the partnership. Um, Human Rights Commission, critically important. So looking forward to the hearing. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, echoing uh, the comments of my uh, of my uh, colleagues, I just wanted to also note that this is something that uh, we need to make sure we get ahead of before we're responding to something. You know, we uh, in East Boston, we had the unfortunate incident, I think it was in 2019, where um, and, and some individuals thought it was okay to put up a lot of uh, white supremacist posters on in, a, in our throughout our neighborhood. And really it was just, it was meant to be a sign of intimidation. Luckily, you know, the, the, the community really was not, uh, it, it only brought us together. And I'm happy about that. The same thing, we had that flash mob in Charlestown where there was some right wing, kind of some white supremacist groups did a flash mob kind of protest at the monument. And so again, we're seeing these kind of sparks and flashes and we just want to make sure that as a city of Boston, we're so far ahead of this and so able to respond to this um, because we understand what these moments are. They're trying to play, prey on our differences, trying to make us fear each other. And instead, we need to turn them on their head and come together, uh, be proud of the diversity that we have and stand by each other. And we need to make sure the city resources are there and ready and able. And more than in many, many languages, as Councillor Flynn and Councillor Mejia often push for, but also to make sure that they're also culturally sensitive as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, physical hands for those who want to add their names, please. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach. Did I get everyone? Please also add uh, the chair. This is docket. Madam, Madam uh, President, if I can also be added. Yes, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Arroyo. Do I have everyone? Thank you so much. Uh, docket 0165 will be referred to the Committee of Civil Rights. Um, we will now move on. And now we're going to take a few dockets um, out of order at a request of a colleague. So. We will uh, 
move with docket 0168 in this next section, Madam Clerk, and docket uh, 0177, if you could just get that one ready. So we're gonna take those two dockets out of order, and then we're gonna go through the dockets in order as they appear on your agenda, okay? Thank Madam Clerk, could you please read docket 0168? Thank you. Wait, you know what? Um, I'm going to, at this time, turn it over to uh, Councillor O'Malley, if he is, <laughs> if Margo will, okay, there we go. <laughs> if if Margo says it's okay, we're going to turn it over to Councillor O'Malley. Um, so, Councillor O'Malley, you have the, the floor. The chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And, and Margo will likely have a lot to say, uh, but uh, she's smiling right now, so that's a good thing. So, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, please uh, place the matter before the body. Docket number 0168, Councillors Sabi, George, and Wu offer the following order for hearing regarding creating an admission policy, improving partnerships, and changing funding for Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. The chair now recognizes the at-large counts from Dorchester. Councillor Sabi, George, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. I ask to suspend Rule 12 and add Council President Janey as an original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, uh, Rule 12 is suspension and the Council President is added as an original co-sponsor. Thank you. Uh, on December 11th, I had a wonderful lunch and learn conversation with Kevin McCaskill, the Executive Director of Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. We learned so much about the incredible learning opportunities at Madison, the challenge the pandemic has created for the school, and the really wonderful community that makes Madison Park so great. Madison Park is a vocational school unlike any other one in the Commonwealth. It does not have an admissions policy, some degree of financial independence, or a high quality facility like other regional vocational schools in the Commonwealth. These changes are long overdue, and it is a continuation and a refile for sure of the work that uh, many of us have been doing over the last few years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Saibi George. The chair now recognizes uh, the at large council from Roslindale. Councillor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm eager to continue partnering with both of my colleagues on this. We've been working on it for some time, lifting up Madison Park as the jewel of our district and um, all the many ways that we can learn from so many resources and um, paths already tread in this, in this area from schools all across the Commonwealth uh, right here available to us who have been sharing with us the best practices. So um, this needs to be a priority for the city. I'm eager to keep working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. The chair now recognizes the council president, Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to start by thanking my sisters in service, Councilor Asabi George and Councilor Wu for their partnership and for their leadership on this issue. Um, Madison is in my district. Uh, and it's a, it's a gem, not just for my district, for the entire city. And it's, it's my belief um, that we are on the right track. And if we continue to support and continue to make sure that Madison has what it needs, Madison could be critically important to our economic recovery as we try to find our way out of COVID. So I am just grateful for the partnership and um, ask my colleagues to sign on and support. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, seeing no further blue hands, uh, would any counselors wish to add their name uh, to this docket? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Liz Braden, Councillor Ed Flynn, Councillor Julia Mejia, Councillor Ricardo Arroyo, Councillor Andrea Campbell, Councillor Lydia Edwards, Councillor Michael Flaherty, Councillor Frank Baker, Councillor, Ke Councillor Kenzie Bach, please add the chair's name. Uh, and docket number 0168 shall be referred to the Committee on Education and School Matters. Uh, Madam Clerk, continuing out of order, please uh, place docket 0177 before the body. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Docket number 0177, Councillors Asabi, George, and Janey offer the following order for hearing regarding the implementation of an ethnic studies curriculum in Boston Public Schools. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The chair now recognizes the at-large counsel from Dorchester, Councillor Saibi George, you have the floor. Thank you again, Mr. Vice President, and thank you to Council President Janey for joining me as a co-sponsor on this hearing order again. We had a very successful hearing at the end of last year, 
I want to do all that we can to ensure that the Ethnic Studies pilot program is a success and can be responsibly expanded in the coming years. Because of the nature of the Ethnic Studies work, it is critical that as, a, as the program expands across the district, it does so with educators who are well-trained, resources that make it worthwhile, and robust administrative support. Every student will benefit from Ethnic Studies, and we, we will have a healthier, more understanding city as well. We need that kind of community more, more now than we ever have. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Councilor Saiby George. The chair now recognizes the council president. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to once again partner with my system in service, Councilor Saiby George, on this very important issue. Um, this is an issue clearly that we need to continue to advance uh, in, in hopes that we will all learn to appreciate and respect uh, each other much more than we currently do. So I'm grateful to continue this conversation and want to thank all the amazing uh, educators uh, who have been uh, working on this issue and, and put this forward. So grateful to continue this work. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, seeing no further uh, discussion on this docket, would any counselors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add Counselor Liz Braden, Counselor Julia Mejia, Counselor Ricardo Arroyo, Counselor Andrea Campbell, Counselor Lydia Edwards, Counselor Michael Flaherty, Counselor Michelle Wu, Counselor Kenzie Bach, Counselor Ed Flynn, please add my name. And docket 0177 shall be referred to the Committee on Education in School Matters. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. And now we will go back and, and stay in order with our agenda. Uh, we are at docket 0166. Yes. Madam Thank Clerk, you. if you would please read that into the record. Certainly. Docket 0166, Councillor Asabi George offered the following order for hearing regarding the implementation of the BPS Ready Reopening Plan. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes uh, Councillor Sabi George. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. If we could also take matter 0170, 0171, 0176, 0178, 0179, and 01. So I'm going to add slow down and repeat that. So if we could take matters uh, 166, 170, 171. 176, 178, 179, and 180 together, just to save time. Do you want 80 and, and 8? Do you want 80? Are you skipping 80 and going? We'll take 80 as well. 80 and 81. So may I yes. just confirm this? You are taking. Uh, six. Uh, one six six. Once one six. seven zero. Oh, I'm going to suggest that no, we're just going to do one six six. When we get to the agenda where they're grouped, we'll group them. Right. So we have grouping. Yes. It'll so, Madam Clerk, please just sure. read uh, this docket again, so we can be sure that it is before us. Okay. All right. We'll speak to this uh, docket, and then we'll go. Great. Okay, Madam. I won't, speak to it. I won't speak to it, Madam President. She can just read it into the record. Okay, fine. Okay, perfect. So we have, Madam Clerk, I'm just going to ask you to repeat. Please read docket 0166 into the record. Docket 0166, Councilor Asabi George offered the following order for hearing regarding the implementation of BPS Ready Reopening Plan. You know what, Madam Clerk, listen. Um, Councillor Sabi George, I would suggest to you if we take docket 169 and 167 and 169 out of order, that way the rest of your dockets will be grouped the way you want. 169 uh, is a petition, or did you want to speak to that petition altogether? Because that's being assigned to a different committee. So uh, Madam President, 166, that's simply a refile. Those are my remarks. We can move now to 167. Thank you. And I'll speak to that. Together. Madam Clerk, would you please read 167? Into Thank, the you. Thank you. Docket 0167, Councillor Sabi George offered the following order for hearing regarding the fiscal year 2020 Boston Public Schools transportation budget. 
Thank you, Madam President. I'll speak to 167. Uh, every year uh, since joining this body, I have filed a hearing order to assess the BPS transportation budget halfway through the school year, as it's an important point in time in which we see any potential cost overruns or cost savings. In years past, we've seen rising costs due to the number of students being transported across the city or out of our school district to charter schools as well as to parochial schools. This pandemic obviously has had many implications for BPS and the transportation department. In preparation for our budget cycle, I look forward to holding this conversation again and understanding the fiscal challenges the pandemic created. Thank you, Madam President. So this is docket uh, 0167. Don't see anyone who wants to speak to it or show a physical hands for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, please add uh, Councilor Braden, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Boo, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Baker, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Bach, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Flaherty. Did I get everyone who would like to add their name? Please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0167 will be referred to uh, the Committee of Ways and Means. Madam President, did did anyone want to uh, sign we're, on to zero one six six? We're not uh, dealing with just that one just yet, um, and okay. Councilor Sabi George hasn't even Great. spoken to that. Um, Councilor Sabi George, do you want to speak to the the petition now? Sure. Docket zero one six nine. Madam Clerk, would you please read that into the record? Certainly. Docket 0169, Councilor Sabi George offered the following petition for a special law regarding enfranchising the Boston School Committee student member. The chair recognizes Councilor Sabi George. Thank you, Madam President. As you all know, the student member of the Boston School Committee currently does not have the right to vote, even though the member is as engaged in the proceedings as every other committee member. This home petition will change that and fully enfranchise the student member. I'm looking forward to having this conversation, doing this work, and passing this petition. I'm grateful to my colleagues who have already expressed their support of this docket and look forward to the work ahead. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Okay, seeing no speakers, show physical hands. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Brock, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Wu, Councilor Mejia, did I get everyone? Please also add the chair, docket 0169. Madam President, I'm not sure if you got me, my video is. Thank you. Please also add Councilor Campbell. Mm -hmm. Do I have everyone now? Thank you. Docket 0169 will be referred to the Committee of Government Operations. Now, Councilor Asabi George, let's take the docket one six six six. Um, but let's make sure we get the other dockets on the table. Yeah. Madam Clerk, if you could please read uh, docket zero one seventy. Would you like that one as well? Yes. And docket zero one seven one. So we'll take those two. If you could read those two into the record. Okay. Docket 0170, Councilor Asabi George offered the following order for a hearing regarding the work of the Boston Student Advisory Council and their policy agenda. And do you want me to read 7 1? Uh, if you could read 7 what? 1, and, and then Sorry. we're going to also read 7 6 and 7 8. Okay. 0171, Councilor Asabi George offered the following order for a hearing regarding the governance structure of the Boston School Committee. Then seven, six and seven, eight? Yes. Okay. Docket zero, one, seven, six. Councilor Sabi George offered the following hearing. Ordering, order for a hearing regarding the review of curriculum resources and standards of the Boston Public Schools. And docket zero, one, seven, eight. Councilor Sabi George offered the following order for a hearing regarding the libraries and library staff of Boston Public Schools. Do we want seven, nine, and eighty also? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, docket zero one seven nine. Councilor Sabi George offers the following order for hearing regarding ensuring all Boston public schools have full time mental health 
and social emotional support specialist and docket 0180 counselor sabotage offered the following order for hearing regarding special education services in the boston public schools and if i can just um, confirm we are still you're going to speak to 0166 yes counselor sabi george is speaking to all of these dockets together I wanted to be sure Yes, Councillor Sabi George, you have the floor. These are multiple dockets, folks. Okay, go thank, ahead. Councilor thank Sabi. you, Madam President. In an effort to be brief and to simplify and to, to group a number of hearings all in one, we created a little bit of mess, and I apologize for that. Along with the ethnic studies hearing order that I've already spoken to, these dockets, 166, 170, 171, 176, 178, 179, and 180, aim to ask the question, what makes for an ideal, welcoming, well-resourced Boston Public School? Or asked in other ways, hmm, oh, my internet's unstable there. Or asked in other ways, what are the curriculum resources our students and educators need? What support services are available? Who is making the decisions that impact the daily lives of our students? What are we doing to ensure that every student has what they need to succeed? For many of these hearing orders, we've already begun the work, but much more work remains to be done and we can always dig deeper. Our students' lives and their futures are what's at stake. I look forward to continuing these conversations, to continuing these, this work, learning from our students, educators, support staff, and the administration, and doing the work that's so necessary so that in every neighborhood across our district, all of our schools are, are providing the high quality education that meets the needs, that exceeds the needs of our students and helps them thrive. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Seeing no speakers, uh, show of physical hands and we're gonna take each docket one by one. Uh, this is docket 166 to show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Wu, Councilor Mejia, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Bach, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Braden, Councilor Royo, and Councilor Baker. Councilor Flaherty, if we can get you. Please also add the chair. We'll move on to Dr. Madam, Madam Chair, point of clarification, that was 166, correct? Yes. We're going to okay. take each one individually. So okay. Thank you. They want to sign on to. So this is. Numbers Dr. may not all be consistent. Thank right. you. They're not going to be consistent. Right. Okay. Okay, just to be clear. So this is docket 0166. Um, and it's being assigned to the committee, referred to the Committee of Education. We will now move on to docket one, 0170, show of hands. Madam Clerk, if you would please add Councilor Braden, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Flynn, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Bach, Councillor Wu, Councillor Mejia. I think I got Councillor Flaherty, but just in case. Anyone else? Uh, sorry, I, I, I took this my 71. Yes, 171. No, no, no. This is docket 0170. Zero. Zero. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are you? Okay? I do not want to sign on. No, thank you. That's okay. Yep, yep. And did you say Campbell? Campbell, Seven. Councilor Campbell, please yeah. add Councilor. Add me to all of hers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All that of makes it simple. The chair's going to be adding on to all of them, too. <laughs> we we still have to, we still I have know. to. This is all the work. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I'm totally confused now. Where are we? What talk are we speaking <laughs> about Councilor, right now? Councilor Bates. 0170. Yes. Add all of it. No, I'm joking. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Seven zero. Seven zero. Okay. Yeah. I do not want to sign on to this one. Thank you. Now that you have all of the names, Madam Clerk, this docket, zero of one seven zero is being referred to the Committee of Education. We are now, Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, we are now on docket zero one seven one. Thank okay. you. I'm normally much better than that, Madam Chair. I apologize. That's okay. Laser uh, focused from here on in. <laughs> We're on docket 0171, show of physical hands, people. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Baker, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Bach, Councilor Wu. Councilor Flynn, I think I got you. Oh, his screen is frozen, never mind. Councilor Campbell. 
Thank you. Please also add the chair. Docket. Are we able to speak on that? Would you like to speak? Yes. I would just just some yes. brief, brief the, comments. The, the chair um, recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize for all the confusion that, I, that I've caused. Um, this, this Boston School Committee, the structure of the school committee is something that I filed under two separate mayors. Um, uh, under Menino, under, under Walsh, um, I do think, I just want to get, the, get it out there, I do think that there's an opportunity here to do at least a um, hybrid version of this because at the end of the day, it will be the mayor's, the mayor's budget here, so I do believe that the mayor should still control the the uh, the school committee four votes or three votes whatever that is we'll keep that in the back of your mind and that's that's a consistent position that's been through th well we don't know who the next mayor is but it, it, someone potentially on this call is going to be the next mayor and, and I just want to make sure and be clear that my position will remain constant through Menino through Walsh through the Nessick administration thank you and please sign on bye. Thank you so much. Councilor Royo, did he sign on? Yeah. Yes, so please add Councilor Royo and Councilor Mejia. Yes, I think we already have you, Councilor Braden. Do yes, we do. Yep. Okay. Yes. We have everyone. Yep. Okay, okay. All right, so everyone's good on where we are. <laughs> this is docket 0171, and it is being referred to the Committee of Education. No. Zero one seven six. Yes, indeed. So, does anyone want to speak? Just so that we, okay, show a physical hands. This is docket zero one seven six. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Council O'Malley, Council Flynn, Council Mejia, Council Wu, Council Campbell, Council Flaherty, Councilor Bach, Councilor Edwards. Did I, Councilor Royo? Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0176 is being referred to the Committee of Education. We are on docket 0178. Everyone clear? Anyone want to speak? Show a physical hands, please, for those who want to add their names. This is docket 0178. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Brayton. Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Royo, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Wu, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Bach. Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0178 will be referred to the Committee of Education. We are on docket 0179, people. Anyone want to speak? Show of physical hands. This is docket 0179. Madam Clerk, would you please add Councilor Braden, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Bach, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, I got you Councilor Bach, uh, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Wu, Councilor Flaherty, please also add the chair. Okay, that was docket 0179. We are on docket 0180, and this is the last in this series. This is docket 0180. Anyone like to speak? Thank you. Show of physical hands. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Bach, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Baker, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Royo, Councillor Mejia. Did I miss anyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0180 will be referred to the Committee of Education. Woo. So with those, are, <laughs> I believe we still have before us docket zero. Madam Clerk, please confirm uh, 0172. This is a resolution. We do. We do. That is next on the docket. If you would please read it into the record. Okay, 0172. Councillor Asabi George offered the following resolution in support of waiving MCAS in spring 2021. The chair recognizes uh, Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Asabi George, you have the floor. Hello? Councillor Asabi George? Here we go. Oh. Uh, I, I first <laughs> apologize for all of that earlier confusion. 
Um, but here we are with 0172. Last week, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education announced that the MCAS exam would continue this year, though it would not be a high school graduation requirement and it would be a shorter test. While standardized testing can be used as an assessment tool, it is clear to me that holding the MCAS this spring would, as only an assessment tool, would be assessing a student's privilege. Even though the test is shorter, it will be an administrative burden and will take away critical learning time from our students. MCAS will tell us nothing new. We know our students are struggling. Our teachers know what our students need to work on and what barriers they are experiencing every day in their learning. There is more wisdom and knowledge in a classroom Zoom breakout room than there is in the MCAS. I urge DESI or the state legislature to once again cancel the test this year. I ask to suspend the rules and pass this resolution. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Anyone looking to speak, add their name, show physical hands. Madam Clerk, if we could please add Councilor Mejia, Councilor Braden, Councilor uh, Flynn, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Bach, Councilor Wu, Councilor Baker, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Arroyo. Anyone else? Did I miss anyone? Please, oh, Councilor Campbell, please also add the chair. Um, this is a resolution, yes. Are you seeking suspension of the rules? Yes, um, I asked to suspend the rules and pass this. Okay, one. wonderful. So, Councilor Sarvi George is seek, uh, seeking suspension of the rules and adoption of this docket. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. This is docket number 0172. Yes. Uh, Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flaherty's on yes. mute. Yes. Uh, yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam, Madam President. Do I, Madam President. Um, uh, uh, Just one second. Um, please add my name as well. Oh, okay. It, it, we, we got you. We got uh, you the first time. Um, um, so Ma Madam President, uh, docket 0172 has been adopted with a unanimous vote. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, I'm going to ask you to read the next three dockets together, and I will let you know what they are since we've taken a lot of out of order. Uh, these are dockets 0173, 0174, and 0175. If you could read those together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Docket 0173, Councilor Sabi George offered the following petition for a special law regarding an act, uh, regarding an act, I'm sorry, regarding an act regarding the disability pension for Harry Dean. Docket number 0174, Councilor Sabi George offered the following petition for a special law regarding an act regarding the disability pension for Ryan Lenane. And docket number 0175, Councilor Sabi George offered the following petition for a special law regarding an act regarding the disability pension for Terry Cotton. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Sabi George. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. These doc dockets are a refile from last year. I look forward to wor working with Councilor Edwards, Chair of the Government Ops Committee, to ensure a swift amendment process and passage of these home rule petitions. Passing these dockets will go a long way to help three retired office officers who are seriously injured in the line of duty. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Edwards. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I muted? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. I do want to thank Councilor Sabi George for her steadfast leadership and pushing for this conversation again to happen. I want to be clear to everyone that the reason why this is going to happen 
um, why we're bringing this back again is because I feel that the, the body specifically needs to have an orientation again in what we are going to uh, vote for. While the three dockets have been um, kind of presented together, they are three individual dockets of which people will be judged on their individual merits as to whether they should be getting um, an exception to the current retirement process, allowing them to have instead of 80% right now, 100% of their disability, uh, looking at whether they should be examined on that disability and looking at whether there should be any prohibition for their ability to work in law enforcement afterwards. I wanna be very clear to people, this is a home rule petition, but we it first starts with the city council. Also, um, it is about the precedent that we're setting. These are individuals, but it's about the precedent that we're setting. Initially, there were seven individuals looking to retire, and there will be more who come forward as we set the precedent as to whether you can or cannot or should or shouldn't petition the city council. We have done five of these since 1995. They are rare. So as more are coming, I think we as a body need to have a collective conversation about how we're going to assess them. Because I, do, I think, one, we're in a fiscal moment and we're looking at our fiscal uh, our fiscal health but two these are lifetime permanent um, disability benefits that care, go with a person for the rest of their life and then their spouse um, until she or he dies or remarries so these are serious things and these are serious conversations and also acknowledging the work and sacrifice of any of our civil servants is something that we also need to do and we do not ever want them to feel that they are being disrespected or dismissed or denied their proper um, compensation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards. The show of physical hands will take uh, each docket individually. Uh, beginning with docket 0173, show of physical hands to add your name. Madam Clerk, if you would please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bott, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Braden. Docket 0173, and Councillor Fla um, Flaherty, please add Councillor Flaherty. Docket 0173 is being referred to the Committee of Government Operations. We will now move on to docket 0174. Show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Bach, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Baker, Councillor Braden, Councillor Flynn. Docket 0174 is being referred to the Committee of Government Operations. Next is Docket 0175. Show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Braden, Councillor Baker, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Bach, and Councillor Flaherty. Docket 0175 is being referred to the Committee of Government Operations. Um, we've already done those. I believe we are on docket 0181. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> we found our way <laughs> to the maze. <laughs> Will you please read that into the record? My pleasure. Docket 0181, Councilor Bach offered the following order for hearing regarding potential zoning amendments to be proposed by the Boston Groundwater Trust. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Brock. Councilor Brock, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Madam President. I think as, me as all members of the council know, much of the land that makes up our city of Boston is filled land. It's uh, sand and gravel that was placed on top of mud flats to expand Boston's buildable land. Um, we did major work on that front in the 1860s and then continued um, ever since. And uh, wood pilings were driven through that fill. Um, which then formed the basis, the sort of foundation for many, many, many buildings, um, both houses and large structures, um, everything from Trinity Church and Copley Square, BPL, they're all sitting on uh, these pilings. Um, and, uh, and you really, you wouldn't have the Boston that we know and love without the uh, areas that have been built on these mud flats. Um, and it's really an amazing technology that has stood, stood the test of time. But the key thing is that for the pilings not to rot um, and to hold up these buildings that we treasure, um, they need to be submerged. And so as a result, we have a deep civic collective interest in our groundwater levels across Boston. Um, and I know this is something, you know, it's of, uh, it's of deep concern to those of us district councilors who have a lot of this in our districts. Uh, most of my district is on this basis. I think there's lots of councilors, Flynn and Janie and Edwards is, that are also on this basis. Um, and it's, you know, it's an existential thing for our neighborhoods that these groundwater levels be well stewarded. Um, and to that end, Boston created the Boston Groundwater Trust 
trust, um, which has really done amazing work uh, to steward that resource and to make sure that whenever someone is building in Boston in these areas, that they're taking appropriate steps to make sure that groundwater is recharged and, um, and everyone's pilings are being protected. Uh, the matter before you today is um, that the Boston Groundwater Trust, basically since its zoning, the Groundwater Conservation Overlay District went into effect um, back in the mid 2000s. Um, the Groundwater Trust has done considerably more surveying of the city. Um, and so has determined a number of parts of the city that are not in the overlay district, um, but actually include a lot of buildings on these pilings. So one is Audubon Circle in my um, neck of the woods. Uh, there's a significant section of East Boston, a piece of the South End, um, a piece of kind of downtown. So again, a lot of different districts. Um, and, and it really is time to update that zoning, both in terms of the areas included and then um, some sort of common sense provisions that have to do with uh, the length of pilings that the trust has found in different parts of the city. Um, and, uh, and so these are sort of their common sense important zoning amendments that the groundwater trust wants to bring forward. And there is a formal process for that, which they're gonna go through at the zoning commission. But this is also an issue of critical importance to just average Bostonians who live in these neighborhoods. And we wanna make sure that there's a good public forum um, for the Groundwater Trust to explain the proposed amendments and how they're gonna forward this stewardship work um, and to answer people's questions and take people's comments and concerns. Um, so parallel to the kind of formal technical zoning amendment process, um, I'm partnering with the Groundwater Trust today uh, to file this hearing order so that um, in, in short order, we can have a public hearing and kind of get that conversation going because um, the Groundwater Trust, like I said, they're a, real, they're a real steward of a common asset that we share and they wanna be responsive to the public and able to make the public aware of uh, some of the amendments that they'd like to propose to the zoning. So I'm really grateful to Christian Simonelli, the executive director there. Um, and uh, I know that uh, Councillor Edwards brought um, him in to talk to uh, most of us councillors at a lunch last year, um, and it's an issue that a lot of colleagues are concerned about. And I just want to create this public forum so that anybody who lives in, in the current overlay district or where the overlay district would be extended to has an opportunity to learn about this, uh, this key, literally underground aspect of uh, what holds our city up. So thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councillor Bach. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I wanna say um, thank you also to Councillor Bach for calling this important hearing order. We had one recently uh, with the Water and Soil Commission and with the Groundwater. It was very informative. Looking forward to this hearing with um, Councillor Bach and it impacts my district greatly, including the Back Bay, Beacon Hill, downtown, uh, Fort Point as well. Last year, Madam President, I had the opportunity to go to, to visit East Boston. They were installing um, a well in one of the um, streets in East Boston. So I'm gonna probably set up a tour if anyone is interested on the council, maybe sometime this spring or in the summertime um, when, when one of these wells are installed somewhere in Boston, uh, maybe we can go on a tour and watch it. It's very interesting and very informative. So. Uh, thank you, Council Bach, for this uh, important hearing order. You're not unmuted, Madam President. What is that? This is a record. Um, sorry about that. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to um, I, I just want to sign on and and, and thank the, the the lead sponsor here. This is a very very important issue, not very sexy, but very important. And and I just wanted to show my support and sign on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing no other speakers, show of physical hands, please, for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Wu, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Campbell. Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair, Councilor Baker. And please also add the chair. This is docket 0181, and it will be referred to the Committee of Planning, Development, and Transportation. We will now move on to uh, docket 0182. Thank you. Docket 0182, Council of Bach offered the following order for hearing regarding supplemental sidewalk clearance programs during snowstorms in Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. This is a municipal services um, day for me. Uh, but uh, as everyone remembers, we had a big snowstorm back on December 17th. Um, and I'm sure I was not alone amongst counselors in hearing from people about places where the snow had not been cleared. Um, and uh, in some cases had not been cleared four or five days later. Um, and one of the, um, and, you know, for me, actually, as a district counselor, this was my first snowstorm as a district counselor. Um, and so uh, after, after getting to enjoy cross-country skiing in the common, I then got to appreciate this other aspect of it, uh, which is the question of what we do with the snow. Uh, and, you know, I think that we have really great work done by Public Works to clear the roadways, um, whether that's, you know, for cars, for bikes, anything that's the roadway, the city clears it um, and does an excellent job. Um, but then we've got the sidewalks and uh, the sidewalk clearing, as everyone knows, is very uh, uneven. Um, and in Boston, every property owner is responsible for clearing their sidewalk. Um, and some do that better than others. And I think the city has tried to really step up enforcement in recent years. Um, but a wrinkle is, is that technically, if you own a property that abuts where the crosswalk is or the intersection, you're actually supposed to clear your sidewalk all the way to the roadway so that somebody has a clear lane of travel. Um, but in practice, I think a lot of property owners do not know or don't regard that as being their responsibility. And so we end up with a situation where our intersections are sort of blockaded by snow that has been pushed on by the plows. Um, also should acknowledge some property owners might clear it and then it gets pushed by the plows, right, and recovered. And so you end up with these walls at a lot of our key intersections um, and sometimes little goat paths, right, of like one footprint that's been placed over them. And, you know, that's okay for some agile members of our community, um, but it can literally block many members of our community from getting around in the days after a snowstorm. It's a disaster if you have a stroller, if you have a wheelchair, um, if you have even just a cane, um, uh, and need kind of that more full space. So, you know, it's one of those things where the, the capacity for city resources to clear all sidewalks um, at the same level they clear all roadways, it would be huge. And the reality is I do think it's important for all of our property owners to do their part. But I think a big storm like what we saw on the 17th shows the limitations of that approach. Um, and when we went looking about, um, and, uh, and credit to you know, constituents, lots of other people reached out about this, when we went looking for solutions, what we found is that there are a number of cities kind of to our north. So Rochester, New York is a key one that I've mentioned in the hearing order, um, but also uh, St. John's up in Newfoundland, um, places that see these large snowstorms even more frequently than we do. A lot of them deal with it by having a city program that would supplement sidewalk clearance and plow the sidewalks um, if the snow level is above a certain cutoff. So for instance, in Rochester, it's if more than four inches of snow falls, the city does this supplemental clearance. And they do it for like 800 and something um, uh, miles of, uh, of sidewalk, and they just run a bunch of si a bunch of like sidewalk plowing routes, and it becomes part of what the city does, um, and they pay for it with a small additional assessment um, that's very modest, and that I think people really appreciate the service for. And I, I think that there are different models um, as we looked around. Some places do it kind of across the board, all sidewalks. Some places sort of designates them arterial sidewalk routes and do that. Um, I think that there's lots of things for us to discuss. Uh, and I do think whenever you talk about adding something to the plate of public works, you have to think about how you're gonna finance it, how you're gonna staff this. Is it a workforce development opportunity, right? Is there a local workforce that could do this? Um, but it's also gonna be occasional. So how do you think about that? There's lots of nuts and bolts questions. I think the core philosophical commitment for me is that it is just important for pedestrians to be able to get around our city in the wake of a snowstorm as for vehicles to do so. Um, and I don't regard the latter as a greater public purpose than the former. So I think this is a place where we need to think about our fundamental infrastructure in the city um, and what we're prioritizing and how to shift um, so that we are also prioritizing pedestrians. Because I don't think any of our constituents should be functionally trapped in their homes um, for days after a storm because it's uh, not safe for them to get around. So I'm looking forward to having a hearing order about this and thinking about how to work with our um, public works department and our city budget to come up with something workable um, that could really address uh, this issue before, uh, before too many more storms. So thank you so much, Madam President.
Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Please add my name. It's an interesting idea. It was also interesting to see our colleague uh, take a municipal service issue and weave it into a great policy issue. So uh, sign me up. I get a lot of phone calls regularly with respect to sidewalks uh, not being uh, clearly uh, uh, passable, particularly around our train stations, particularly around our schools, et cetera. So uh, it's a great concept. I was just reading a little bit more about what they're doing in Rochester. So uh, I would, uh, would be happy to partner with her in that effort. And again, municipal services, it's the basic city services that gritty, as Councilor Baker referred, non-sexy stuff. That's what people expect us to do as their city council is both district and at large. So we're where the rubber meets the road with the municipal branch of city government. Uh, and while we're doing things around policy, we can never uh, to take for granted the role that we play in making sure that our streets are safe and clean and that the trash gets removed and that snow gets removed, et cetera. So uh, that's a big part of the role of our council, uh, our council responsibility. So happy to partner and look forward to uh, see if we can get this implemented here in Boston. Thank you, Madam President, and thanks to the sponsor. Thank you so much, Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Council O'Malley. Council O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, congratulations to the District uh, 8 Councilor on a great idea, and congratulations uh, to you and our other new members on your first snowstorm. Um, I actually, I may be the only councilor that won his or her seat in a special election, and there was a major blizzard two days after I was sworn in. Um, so it, you never forget your first um, and uh, the, the calls to prove it. But I think this is a, a fabulous idea and a really important one, as the previous speaker just said, to talk about some of the issues that, that we can really play an impactful role on. Um, several, I'm, I'm bringing up this point that uh, several times, several years ago, I introduced a hearing order on jurisdiction over snow removal. Um, rather than reintroducing it this year, I think this would dovetail nicely in this hearing order because, of course, we have sections of sidewalk that are either city, private property or city property, state, uh, DCR, DOT, MBTA. Obviously, the bus stops is one. Uh, one thing I've been proud to do in my ten, not all ten years, probably I think we started five or six years ago, which is the um, uh, the gift cards for kids who shovel out um, fire hydrants. We've done, uh, including the children of several members of this body, um, who I'm proud to happy to send a five dollar gift card when they uh, do a nice little civ uh, civic service of, of shoveling out their their uh, fire hydrants. We've done hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand gift cards, and I'll continue to do so as long as I can. Um, but, but it's a great it, opportunity when there's not snow on the ground to sort of convene all stakeholders, figure out ways that we could implement this. Jurisdiction is a key piece of it, but I'm delighted to learn more and support uh, Councillor Bach in this endeavor. So please add my name. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, please add my name. I just wanted to highlight the tremendous work Council Bach is doing on this issue. It's incredibly important. Um, I also know that we have to, I want to acknowledge the public works, uh, city workers as well in the Parks Department. Uh, they're doing a terrific job of uh, snow removal in our city. So I want to highlight our dedicated city workers who often go unnoticed, but um, but we see them out there in the blizzards and they're working hard and they're very dedicated and very professional. So I want to acknowledge our city workers for always being there for the residents of Boston. I also want to um, acknowledge there's a group in South Boston called the, uh, it's the Snow Angels at the South Boston Labore Center. Uh, they usually kick off a program where they um, ask volunteers to help shovel out um, homes for seniors and persons with disability disabilities. I know we always kicked it off with Mayor Walsh. We didn't do it this year because of the, the pandemic, but I also know that Councilor Edwards uh, worked with the group as well in East Boston um, on helping people, um, especially our seniors and persons with disabilities. But it, it really takes everybody's effort during a snowstorm to help our seniors, help our persons with disabilities. And as Councillor O'Malley uh, pointed out, um, you know, it's great to see so, ma so many people doing great work out there, especially for those people in, in need. So I wanna highlight, highlight that and say thank you to Councillor Bach. And actually during the last snowstorm, I 
I saw her cross country skiing through Boston Common. Uh, she had skis and the snow, snow, um, snow poles as well. So uh, she was uh, doing a great job and she was doing constituent services as well while she was <laughs> skiing throughout the common. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Baker. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry for being so chatty today. I don't know what's going on in my life. <laughs> but um, I just want to uh, first thank thank the, the, the lead sponsor here. This is something that I've been advocating with, with this administration for, for close to five years. A friend of mine was just appointed the head of New York City Sanitation, which he has 18,000 employees underneath him. They have a list of temporary temporary labor, which they use for just this right here, of 10,000 people. And off that list of 10,000 people, they use that as an entryway into city jobs. So mm -hmm. there's there's multiple opportunities here. I think this is a great idea. And, and um, you know, thank you. Thank you for your, for your leadership on this, Kenzie, and just sign me on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Baker. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. And thank you, Madam President. I, I also want to commend my colleague, uh, Councillor Bach, for her leadership on this. Uh, um, my background is a, is a physical therapist. I, I, uh, the snow hazards that, that our folks with disability or impaired mobility um, face in the, in, a, in the aftermath of a snowstorm uh, are significant. Uh, recently, I observed, I think it was the same snowstorm that we're talking about, um, I observed a, a gentleman with a, 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 a walking assistive device, a walker, trying to get across a, 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 side, a, a pedestrian crossing. When he got across the road, there was, a, there was a mound of snow that blocked his way. He had nowhere to go. Um, and again, this is commonplace. Um, and I think it, it impacts our folks with disabilities and our elders greatly. And I really welcome the conversation and hope that we can come up with some really workable solutions. Thank you, and please add my name. Thank you so much, and I'll just briefly add to the chorus. I think this is uh, incredibly important. I too had lots of calls. You were lucky that you got through your whole year without a storm. Um, I think it was day three for Councillor Flynn, Councillor Edwards and I, and it was a blizzard. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is an important issue. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, show of physical hands. Madam President. Yes, I can't raise like my. Speak? You can't do yeah, your. Yeah, I can't raise no my more. hand. So no I just want to thank you. I just before wanted to quickly wait, wait, before we go on, folks, with the signing on, we're going to give uh, Councillor Campbell an opportunity to speak. And if anyone else couldn't raise their blue hand and would like to speak, we'll allow you the opportunity. The chair thank recognizes you. Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I couldn't raise my hand. That's a disaster. So I apologize. But I just want to thank Councillor Bach um, for your leadership on this. This is a critical issue. We fielded a whole bunch of calls in our last um, storm with respect to this very issue. So thank you. I also want to applaud and thank Councillor Baker for his leadership on this issue, too. He's been pushing it for a long time um, and those creative ideas in response. So thank you and thank you. Add my name and thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Now, if there are no other speakers or show physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Wu, Councilor Baker, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Braden, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty. I have you, Councilor Edwards. Um, please add the chair. Did I get everyone who wanted to Councilor add? Danny, if you can add me as well, Councilor Arroyo. Uh, okay, and Councilor Arroyo. Uh, thank you so much. This is docket uh, 0182, and it will be referred to the Committee of City and Neighborhood Services. We will move on in our agenda. We're almost there, folks. Uh, we are on docket 0183. Madam Clerk, if you would please, we're uh, moving on to personnel orders, and this is docket 0183. Thank you. Docket 0183, Council Janey for Council of Bach. Thank you. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0183. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. 
Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0183 passed unanimously. Thank you so much. Moving on to late file 02 matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and these matters, I'll just quickly tell you what they are. One is a personnel order. And the other is a letter from the mayor. Um, you will have these in your inbox. So I would ask that you would go take a peek. Um, I am going to ask our clerk, once we add these to the agenda, um, I will ask our clerk to start with the personnel order. Um, we need to get these onto our agenda. And okay. so I am wanna let's call the roll <laughs> to you. make sure we have these items properly before us. And then I will have you read the documents. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Um, for two late file matters to be added, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Councilor Baker, thank you. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Council Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Ca Councilor Campbell. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Janey. Yes. Council Janey, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council O'Malley. Yes. Council O'Malley, yes. Council Wu. Yes. Council Wu, yes. And Council Campbell. All right. Uh, those matters are properly before the body, Madam President. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you please start with the late file matter? Certainly. I mean, the uh, personnel. Uh, personnel. <laughs> I was reading your mind. Thank you. Uh, on January 13th, 2021, Councilor Kim Daney for Councilor Mejia. Thank you. Councilor Mejia seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, the first lay file per has been passed unanimously. Thank you so much. We will move on to the second late file matter, which is a letter from our mayor regarding a vacancy. Madam Clerk, would you please read that letter into the record? Thank you. The letter is from Eva Calendar Concepcion, um, and it is addressed to Mayor Martin J. Walsh regarding Boston Public School Committee reassign resignation. Dear Mayor Walsh, please accept this letter as formal notification of my resignation from the Boston Public School Committee, effective immediately. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you and your team over the last several weeks. Regrettably, I received an offer from the Attorney General that conflicts with my role on the school committee. And after careful consideration, I realized that this opportunity is too promising to decline. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to serve the city of Boston. I look forward to working with you in the future. Please feel free to email me at any time. And it just gives a number. Sincerely, Eva Concepcion. 
Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. The second late file matter will be placed on file. I have no green sheets. Uh, moving on the chair to the consent agenda, the chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, I'm gonna ask you to please call the roll. Thank you. Um, for the consent agenda, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor. Do you remember Knuckleback? Oh, my. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, you may want to mute yourself, please. Yeah. Madam, Madam Clerk, if you would continue. Um, and Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, the consent agenda has been approved unanimously. Wonderful. Moving on to announcements. A show of blue hands for those who would like to make brief announcements, please. The chair recognizes Councilor O'Malley. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I know it's been a very long afternoon, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, note that uh, after many, many years, uh, next month, Community Choice Energy or Community Choice Electricity uh, will be the default here in our city. Um, and this came about uh, through the leadership of Councilor Wu and myself. Um, with the support of many members of this body, everyone who was serving at the time, which was about half of you. Uh, it is one of the things that I'm most proud of that we were able to help do, do and, and through the obvious support um, and leadership of Mayor Walsh and Chief Cook and others, it is now a reality. Now, I am very grateful to the uh, Chief Cook's team for doing a really robust community process. The plan all along was to do community meetings, to go out into the neighborhood, to uh, you know do as, as robust a process as humanly possible. Uh, Pre-pandemic, of course, we were able to then be nimble um, and do as good of a job in terms of having culturally competent materials and outreach to people. And, and every week through next month, um, uh, twice a week, actually, Tuesdays and Thursdays, there are virtual office hours explaining this as well as uh, materials sent in many, many different languages to all ratepayers. I bring this up to say that all of you have heard me say ad nauseum that every fiscal conservative ought to be an environmentalist because quite often good sound environmental policy is also going to save uh, cities money, save ratepayers money, and that is certainly being borne out here. So if you have done nothing, uh, your, your electricity bill next month will be on average about three bucks cheaper than it would be, and your renewable energy standards will grow by 10%. I wish it could be higher, but that is an amazing fact. We're saving money and we're growing our renewable energy. If you are able, as my family has done, and I urge you all to do so, you can opt up to 100% renewable energy. It will cost more, there's no doubt about it, um, but the more people do it, the, the less the increase will be. But suffice it to say, and this question will no doubt come up for many of your constituents as it hasn't already, the default system that people have been opted in, and there is a mechanism where individuals could opt out, but we're able to grow our renewable energy standards for our electricity by 10%, which is significant because the default is 18, we're going up to 28%. We're doing it while saving ratepayers money. What could be better than that? So thank you, Councillor Wu, for your uh, partnership on this. Thank you to my colleagues who supported it. I'm really looking forward to seeing the implementation, the success of this really, really innovative, important, and potentially planet saving program. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I, I just wanted to highlight two, two very brief issues. I know my colleagues, I want to say thank you to my colleagues for signing on a, a sympathy, deeper sympathy to Felicity Lingle. Um, I know many of you have talked to her throughout the years, but she's a young woman. Uh, that comes to the city council meetings on Wednesdays. She would usually get there early, like around 1130, but I always like to get there early also, and I always enjoy talking with her. 
she passed away um, recently, and I just wanted to let her family know and her friends know that she played an incredible role in our city, always advocating for persons with disabilities. Um, so she will be missed, and um, I just wanted to highlight um, her incredible work in Boston. And the second thing, Madam President, is today is um, Korean American Day. And I just wanted to acknowledge the important role Koreans have made in our city, in our country, their sacrifice and hard work. Uh, they add so much to our city. They add so much to our nation. And just so proud that we have a Korean community here in Boston and greater Boston. And in, in they make our city and our country better. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Council Flynn. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, I wanted to just make a few remarks on behalf of Irene Golson, who many of you may know, passed away on December the 29th, 2020. It's hard losing someone like Irene because I know that we didn't just lose a fierce advocate, um, a mental wellness a guru, a champion of community. And we already know that she was always a champion for community health. We lost a neighbor, a daughter, and to me, a friend and a mentor. Irene gave me my first job in community health back in the 90s when she was just getting started at ABCD as the manager of education and training. It's crazy to think that almost 30 years ago, and even crazier to think about all of the work and effort Irene has accomplished in 30 years. She easily did 60 years worth of community engagement, mental health and advocacy and education in those 30 years alone. She fought for justice all day, every day, 24-7, 365 days a year. Most recently, she worked with our office on a hearing order addressing sexual assault and BPS, a hearing order in which we refiled today. She showed up countless to countless community meetings to listen, to learn, and to offer sage advice for her years of experience. It feels like everyone I know has had a chance to meet Irene and experience her wisdom and grit. She led with 100% conviction in everything that she believed in and inspired countless activists and community leaders through her work. When losing someone like Irene, it's hard not to feel discouraged, especially when there's so much work left to do in our community. I don't think Irving would want us to give up or feel discouraged. She'll want us to pick up the work where she left off and continue to fight for everything she stood for. This is why our office filed this resolution dedicating January the 14th, 2021, which would have been Irving's birthday as Irene goes in Community Health Day. This will be a day where all of us dedicate, to dedicate ourselves to advocating for better mental health services, particularly among those facing intersectional oppressions through sexual orientation and immigration status. We hope to honor her memory by not focusing on her passing, but by celebrating her life and having her life lived through our work. Rest in peace, Irene. We all love you. Thank you. So much for that. The chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, I, I also just wanted to enter a brief remembrance. Um, back on December 20th, uh, we lost uh, John Connolly, um, who uh, was as a young man at age 21, having grown up um, in the, uh, I think it's the Mary Ellen McCormick project, um, he became the first tenant to sit on the Boston Housing Authority board. Um, and all, and actually I think the first housing, public housing tenant to sit on a public housing board in the country. Um, and uh, really worked as a tag team with Doris Bunty uh, back when, before she was the administrator, before she was elected, the two of them together were part of building this tenant majority on the Boston Housing Authority board. Um, and proud to say that come to today and the Boston Housing Authority still has a tenant majority monitoring board. 
going all the way back to those days. Um, and so, uh, you know, John Connolly was a tenacious tenant advocate and organizer. Um, and he also uh, did a ton for housing in the city, um, working extensively uh, in uh, Ed's dad's administration, um, the Flint administration. Uh, and uh, my grandfather and he worked quite a lot on affordable housing efforts together um, across the city. And, uh, I, and I know we're particularly proud of Tent City um, and the kind of marker it laid down for what it looked like for a community to rise up and assert the need for affordable housing um, and community land control. Um, and just, I know a, a host of things um, that John Connolly did, fingerprints all over the city, also very involved in the beautification of Post Office Square, which if you walk through downtown, you see hundreds of people enjoying any nice day of the year. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, a lot more that could be said about him. I had heard about him growing up and had the pleasure to meet him when I worked at the Housing Authority because he was also um, Bill McGonigal's brother-in-law and mentor um, and uh, just somebody who I, I came um, in the final years of his life to know and really admire. Um, and so just want to uh, express my sympathy for his wife, Anne, and the whole um, McGonagall and Connolly families, and also just express the thanks of the, of the city, because I, I actually think one of the things that really um, differentiates the Boston Housing Authority from housing authorities across the country is tenant leadership um, and a real tenant leadership role. And that's not something we should take for granted. It's not normal. And, um, and it wasn't the case in Boston until... John Connolly and Doris Bunty really fought those honorable fights. So just wanted to say that word, word of remembrance. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I just want to um, remember two community members who passed on recently. Um, first, um, Mrs. Jeannie Woods, who's a, li a lifelong resident of Oak Square, a community activist. She actually ran for state rep at one stage saying that the house needed a woman. A woman in the house was needed. So she ran on that was her that was her slogan as she ran for for us for a state rep many years ago, before I ever lived in in in, in Oak Square. Uh, she was a community activist, uh, an organizer of our neighborhood watch. She served on the um, the BC task force and and she will be missed. Um, uh, as a longtime um, activist and community member who always looked out for our neighborhood. Uh, the other person I'd like to remember today is uh, Sandy Philgate. Uh, Sandy was a native of Vermont and she moved to uh, Boston and made Austin Brighton her home. Uh, she was a longtime member and treasurer of the Friends of the Faneuil Branch Library. Um, the Friends of the Fan Faneuil Branch Library are a fierce bunch of men and women, uh, women and men. <laughs> they saved uh, the, the, the branch library from closure. Um, uh, and, um, and Sandy was always there, a quiet uh, but ever present uh, uh, person in, in, who served our, our neighborhood for many, many years and sadly passed away uh, due to COVID recently. So uh, I, I'd like to remember those two very, very strong and wonderful women in our, in our remembrances today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else looking to make an announcement? Okay. So we will... Oh. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, we would be remiss if we didn't remember our colleague Liz Braden's birthday. I know she celebrated a birthday recently, so happy birthday to happy Liz! Birthday. Uh, yes, and Councillor Wu's birthday is tomorrow, so happy birthday, birthday to, to Councillor Wu! Yes, thank you so much for that, Councillor Flaherty. <laughs> Well, I mean, while we're making a list, we missed we missed Councillor Mejia's too back on the first. Oh, it's the first <laughs> and the December birthdays. <laughs> it's the Capricorn Caucus in the in the City Council. <laughs> and it was dangerously close to being a quorum. <laughs> oh, watch out! Okay, well, we are at the close. Um, as we always do, we close our meetings in uh, memory of those we've lost. Clearly want to continue to lift up the families in Boston who have lost loved ones to COVID. Um, in addition to those we will mention uh, today. So today we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following for Council Bach, Bob Madsen, Nancy Bush Ellis, John P. Connolly, for Councillor Braden, Sandra Philgate, Jane Woods, for Councillor Campbell, 
William Coughlin Jr. For Councillors Campbell, Flynn, and Wu, Felicity Lingle. For Councillor Edwards, Anna Guarino. For Councillor Asabi George, Francis L. Frank Walsh. For the Chair, Julius Fleming. And on behalf of the entire City Council, Irving Goldson, Herman Hemingway, and Bruce Seals, a moment of silence, please. Thank you. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. We are scheduled to meet again on Wednesday, January 27th. So we're skipping next week because of the MLK holiday and we will meet again on Wednesday, January 27th at noon. For the safety of the general public and all those involved, this meeting will be held virtually and posted online Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Seeking a motion to adjourn today's meeting. All in favor? One. Aye. 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 <laughs> Aye. Council meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Happy New Year.